until the team says recording and then it's officially recording. I only have about 20, I only have about 25 minutes of um, opening remarks and then, you know, we'll take it from there. Joking. All right, welcome folks to the spring 2021 Dallas philosophy, Dallas College philosophy on the graduate student conference. Um, I'm Professor Manzi, uh, Dallas College faculty, Richland campus, and uh, it's thrilling to uh, to kick off yet another semester conference. Um, we have a, a full slate. Uh, we'll be having presentations every 15 minutes from now until 3 p.m. And then at 3 p.m. we will conclude the conference with a classic Dallas College Philosophy Club meeting, the topic of which is art and culture. Uh, like I said, we have a full slate. We've had, we have several guest speakers, which I'm excited about. Um, you can find the program. If you go to files on this very team's page, you can see the when and the what of all the presentations from now until the end of the conference. Um, and in just a couple of brief announcements beforehand, uh, the Philosophy Club will be meeting two more times after today. We'll be meeting next Tuesday and then the Tuesday during finals week. Um, again, next Tuesday's topic will be art and politics. And then the final meeting is an open topic. I believe we're collaborating with the art club. So um, that'll be something fun. At any rate, uh, yeah, I believe Isra is, is here. Isra, are you around? Yep, I'm right here. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, our next presenter is Isra Qureshi, um, again, a former student of mine, uh, like Ephraim, former honor student. And um, yeah, I mean, well, I suppose, Isra, since you're, you're scheduled to present right now, I know you also had a question for, for Efren. Did you want to ask your question or do you want to just get to your presentation? I'll leave it up to you. Oh, definitely. I can ask that question. Um, so if... Another aspect of being human is imagination and dreaming and basically um, aspiration for the future. I don't think it has a correlation with time. I understand that how time plays into that imagination, but so long as humans are able to imagine, uh, don't you think that it's kind of counter to human nature, even with liberalism and capitalism in play, even if it's the end of history kind of stage, um, don't you think that so long as the human aspect of imagination and dreaming is there, there's still some way, shape or form we can salvage the future or we can kind of keep it from being truly end of times kind of a thing? Um, I would say that the idea that human humanity is based off of dreaming of the future um, is inherently uh, it's like a as I was saying, it's inherently like a monotonic thing that you're talking about. Um, you're basically just saying that humanity must think of time in this conception where we have to be future oriented. When you look at like sociologically different societies of the past, most societies don't think that way. And that's a very new phenomenon that has occurred with the past several hundred years or so. Right. Okay. So in that case, there's, you're saying that it might take us a while to get there and liberalism is going to kind of beat us to it before we're able to get to that stage yeah more, more or less like liberalism yeah yeah that's more or less yeah okay all right thanks for answering all right i think we can get started with mine um all right so the topic i chose was a uh, gender in a divided society so um essentially a little bit of a background on this in terms of why i aim to title it uh, title it this way was that um, I feel like in recent years, in the past at least five to six years since I've actually been able to uh, comprehend and understand what is gender or what is equality or do I need equality for myself? Do I need to fight for it for others and so on? I feel that as more of us uh, get to that realization where we're kind of driven towards becoming more polarized and more uh, divided as a society. So I wanted to kind of reframe and kind of take a look at, okay, what role does gender have to play now that we're, we're at the stage where uh, pretty much we have all sorts of genders, we have all sorts of identities and means of expression and so on. So um, hopefully this works. I really, my laptop's been going crazy. So if the slides aren't moving forward, I don't know how to fix that one. And it's not moving forward. Oh man. Is it is it a it's a PowerPoint, right? It is a PowerPoint. So it's supposed to move somewhere. I just don't see where the options are. How are you sharing it again? With the PowerPoint. With the PowerPoint, but I, I know it's with the PowerPoint, but are you using the actual PowerPoint or are you sharing through the PowerPoint? 
No, I'm using the actual PowerPoint. I had it opened in a separate window because I know that works best, but my laptop's testing me really hard. So if somebody can kind of take control and stop the sharing, that well, would be cannot, really Well, actually, well, I can request, but I don't know if that's going to do something for you. Okay, let's, let's see how that see. goes. <laughs> it was a trick. Now I have access to your bank account. So <laughs> I never took my bank account. <laughs> let's see. I'm trying to remove away from here. Hmm. Aha, How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, you know, it's just a click, you know, but yeah. I don't know how to go back. There you go. So you can go back and okay, I can. Okay, never go. mind. I got it. I got it. There I you go. It. Okay, so I, I, but I still have control over your computer. So I'm just, I'll just gonna let, you know let myself sharing. be here. I'm going to sit at home. I hope you don't mind. I'll, I'll just let you stop sharing when it's ready because I don't see that option. <laughs> okay, so coming back to my presentation. So uh, that was a little bit of a precursor in terms of what I was thinking when I chose this topic. So first and foremost, let's kind of um, understand the definition of uh, or the difference between gender and sex. So um, a research done by um, Short and um, yeah, Young and um, I believe Miss Jenkins, um, they emphasize the difference that, okay, what does it even mean to refer to somebody's sex or somebody's gender? So they concluded that uh, gender is an emphasize, it emphasizes the socially constructed difference between men and women that give rise to masculine and femininity, uh, masculinity and femininity, while sex is just defined as a biological trait or something that, for example, you have a Y chromosome, you're a male, you have an X chromosome, you're a female. The way gender works is it's part of our identity. It's not only an expression of self, but some would argue that it is the self itself, if, if that makes sense. But essentially, that's how we're looking at um, gender. Dude, you're getting stuck again. Okay, um, Ferdinando, can you help me move forward, please? Thank you. All right, so um, another aspect that we need to look at before we get into this discussion is um, what the implications of uh, implicit bias. So um, we may or may not know, so here's the small definition of how I understand implicit bias to be. It's basically our subconscious understanding or belief in terms of how we view the world, how we interact with others, and how we engage with our environment. So having implicit bias could be a good thing or a bad thing. It depends on the circumstances or how you use it, essentially. Um, in my opinion, I feel like implicit having implicit bias is a good thing if it has to do with the person themselves. For example, uh, when do I want to sleep? When do I want to eat? When do I want to talk to somebody? And so on. Having implicit bias kind of helps us get through the nitty gritties of not having to think about something too much and just getting the job done right away. But I feel like it can be harmful if you're in a position of making decisions for others that can affect others and vice versa that can uh, affect the society as a whole. So um, an example of this was taken by um, Sally Hasslinger's um, lecture she did in one of the universities. I found that on, on YouTube. It's linked at the end, so if anybody wants a reference. I do encourage you all to go and check it out if you guys want to look at what she works on or what she talks about. So essentially, she says that when somebody uh, and when I say somebody, I mean a middle-aged white man who's a, a hiring manager who's trying to hire or fill up a position. He has three candidates in front of him. One of them is a standard white male with a master's degree and so on and so forth. The other two are females from ethnic backgrounds. So one of them is Asian and the other one is Hispanic. The middle-aged white man, because he's got this underlying implicit bias of, okay, men tend to do the job better anyways, or women aren't good enough at their jobs, and whatever else he may be thinking, he will naturally lean towards the white man, even though the other two women are more qualified than the white man. These implicit biases are the ones that are harmful, and these are the ones, in my opinion, that we need to be more careful of and more aware of when we're interacting with um, our environment in that sense. Um, even though it is easier and more natural for us to just go to it by default and just say that, oh, no, there's something about the guy that I trust or no, I lean more towards that ideology for some reason without actually thinking of why that reason is, is when something can become a little bit harmful in terms that that person now is in a loop of, okay, he was underqualified, you have to spend more to kind of train him or bring him up to the mark. 
or you have to kind of ignore everything that he's doing and still give him the pay that he deserves, even though he's not good enough at his job and so on. So there are many other facets that can go with it. So moving on to the next slide. Do you need the helping hand? Yes. There you go. Thank you. All right, so here's the dilemma that I was facing with. Um, I was, a couple days ago, I was watching this Netflix uh, film. I forgot the title, what it's called, but essentially it's a coming of age uh, movie where um, this teenage girl in high school uh, starts a feminist club and she starts this movement, movement along her friends in terms of trying to fight for equality or trying to fight for the injustices that the girls faced at the high school. Examples of which were that um, guys harassed the girls and the um, principal didn't bat an eye. She was like, oh no, uh, you're probably overreacting or you're misunderstanding this and that and so on. Um, in my understanding, a lot of different issues were kind of intertwined within that one movie of like an hour or so, which I feel like was an injustice to each of those topics, but that's, that's a discussion for a separate time. So um, in that a movie they the girls they're trying to follow through with this movement and by the end of it all I could think of was great movement um, not consistent with um, better preparedness or lack of understanding so the girls one of the girls who started this whole club or whatever was so influenced by her mother's uh, rebel nature when she was in college that she tried to implement it in her high school and I feel like that's where the problem began because I feel like the girls did overreact. It was poorly crafted or poorly directed or whatever. But my understanding of it was that the girls didn't understand what it meant or how exactly could they exercise their power or how exactly could they um, get equality. And which kind of led them to do some really stupid stuff that in under normal circumstances, people would get uh, expelled for. People would have um, bad records in terms of academics, or it could even lead to arrest or vandalizing the school property and so on and so forth. And um, the movie didn't choose to show any of that. They just chose to show that um, all these activities forced the principal to cave in. And that's how the girls won by persistence, not by strategy, which in my opinion was poorly thought in terms that any 13 or 14 year old girl who feels that she's being harassed at high school or who feels that, oh yeah, She's facing the same kind of injustice that was portrayed in the movie. She would try to implement the same movement within her school without actually realizing the real life consequences that she could face by the end of once she's through with her plan or once she's been successfully uh, implementing whatever it is she needed to. So the dilemma that I'm posing in front of everybody is that I feel like it's important for us to be aware of how and um, where our biases show and how it affects the members of, of our society within the same age group or outside of our age group and our gender and so on and so forth. I will ask the question of, is there such a thing as too much too soon or in terms of uh, introductions to different topics, in terms of introductions to societal issues and so on? And should we choose who can get involved and when in terms of um, are teenagers allowed to become part of our riots or when should somebody be allowed to form the movement within their school and so on. Moving on to the next slide, please. You don't have to yell, but OK. The thing that I want everybody to think about in terms of um, gender and how it affects the society as of right now is how um, through social media and through other forms of media, Younger people have access to unfiltered content, like I just gave an example of where um, in the movie, this movement was glorified. And like I said, right movement, inconsistent actions or lack of knowledge in terms of uh, backing up the movement. So number one, people, younger people have access to um, these kind of issues without full context and background of where it came from. Why is it important? Is it even relevant at this day and age? Number two, Girls and boys are making their minds up without full uh, context of the issue in terms of, okay, does this even apply to me? Or am I simply over uh, reacting to a situation that's an isolated incident that may have happened to me or somebody I know? And number three, 
um, such people, we have to keep in mind that when they grow up, they will be the ones who will be a contributing factor to our society, and they will be the decision makers of our society. So since such a young age, if you've been exposed to these kind of issues and you've been desensitized to those, how and when would be appropriate for you to kind of take action against those if you're now so motivated and by the end, the time when it comes for you to actually take action, you don't have enough gas in terms of um, wanting to do anything about when there's true injustice happening and so on. So moving on to the next slide, please. I challenge us to kind of change things up in terms of knowing that yes, it's everybody's right to have access to um, these kind of contents and kind of make up their own minds, whether they support it or recommend these movements or these sentiments or these beliefs and so on and so forth. But I feel like there should be an age limit or a maturity gauge in terms of accessing these kind of contents or um, these kind of topics before somebody can actually say that, yeah, this is what I do or this is what I'm interested in. We should also place emphasis on when it comes to job environments and actual um, ability to run an institute like a high school or a or college or anything else where uh, young people are more in contact or at risk of in contact with these uh, issues. There should be a more emphasis on skill and talent as qualifiers for the job instead of assuming that um, someone might perform better simply based on gender or other stereotypes that people would have for a certain race or a certain ethnic group. Moving on to the next slide. I open the floor up for discussion now. And the two questions I want us to focus on a bit more is, is there such a thing as too much too soon in terms of introduction uh, to different topics? It doesn't just have to be gender, it could be anything. And should we get to choose who can get involved and when do they get involved with us in the movement or whatever it is that we're trying to discuss or whatever it is we're trying to reach a conclusion for? Thank you so much. The floor is now open for discussion. I don't know how much time I've left, but yeah, my intention was to have a discussion. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Isra. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, unfortunately, we, we are out of time, but if you would like to continue to discuss uh, these topics with Isra, feel free to, or, or with everybody who's present, feel free to have conversations in the chat, or you can always, um, I, I suppose, uh, message Isra directly and, um, you know, have like a conversation that way. Uh, yeah, y'all are more than welcome to um, continue to talk about all the presentation topics as we move forward. Um, especially if we don't have time uh, to, to field questions for the presenters. But um, thanks, Isra. Okay, uh, the next presentation is Baunak Fan. Um, I don't know if he's present or not. And if he's not, I suppose we could keep the floor open for you, Isra. Let's see here. Bao okay. present. All right, well, I don't see Bao in the. Um, I don't see Bao in the Teams page, so yeah, I suppose we could uh, we could actually field some questions for Isra, and um, if he shows up, great. But if not, we'll continue this discussion. Um, well, does anybody have any responses to Isra's questions or or discussion topics? Yeah, uh, Osita. Ah, uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, hi. Sorry. Um. Yeah, thanks. Great presentation, Ezra. Uh, I guess I had a question, and I'm going to couch this um, specifically in terms of, I guess, like American society, because these are the law. America, right, we have a right to own firearms. We also have a right to peacefully assemble, to protest. There are age restrictions on our right to own firearms. Do you think that there should be legislation on a person's right to protest should it not be until the age of being able to vote or what would be your kind of views on something like that i agree good or bad um people need to have that restriction in terms of okay if you're old enough to vote that means you're old enough to make a decision of what's right and wrong you're old enough to decide for yourself if that is something you want to support or not so I feel like uh, even if it comes down to peaceful prote protesting, like in the 60s, we've seen it a lot. I've seen it a lot in the movies where um, parents would be uh, going for peace marches and they would be bringing their toddlers or they'd be bringing in their uh, children who are still in grade school. So um, 
for for them to be bringing such young influenceable minds to these kind of protests is asking a lot in terms of human intellect when it's still developing in my opinion because at that point that is where your biases and your implicit biases start setting in and that's where you kind of have this either rosy worldview of the entire um, society or you have this nihilistic kind of uh, impression of the world that okay everything is bad nothing is safe I'm never going to be safe or on the other hand I can trust everybody I can say whatever I want to anybody without any consequences to my, my health or without any consequences to my livelihood so in those terms I feel like good or bad that wherever the balance is off the there's always going to be a problem whether it leans more toward the right or to the left or in your favor or my favor either way it's just going to be out of balance and that out of balanceness is going to show up somewhere down the line like 20 30 years later so so you would argue that um something of such a charged political nature um, just shouldn't really even be exposed to kids until a certain until they're mature enough, I guess, to handle it. Yes, I agree because uh, I will take an example from my parents' age. So uh, in Pakistan, there was a very severe censorship in terms of uh, what kind of content kids could watch. And my dad does tell us that um, when he was in high school, even um, there they had like bedtime and special programming that they they showed uh, after a certain period of time. So I think after 8 p.m. at night or something, uh, that's when they would start broadcasting political news. Before then, it would be all uh, cartoons or other stuff that uh, was age appropriate for the children. And so um, the way it impacted my father is that um, he's been part of um, movements, political movements within his college. But that was once he was at the college and once he saw that, okay, no, I can decide for myself if this is truly right or wrong, if this is justice or injustice, am, am I supposed to be a voice in that or not? And I feel like a contributing factor to that was the um, censorship he had beforehand and kind of just have the ability to kind of feel himself out before he steps into that world. And instead of making mistakes, he truly backed up the support of whichever party that he supported and whichever movement that he was behind. He really made it a conscious choice Instead of a, a societal choice in terms of, oh, this is what my friends did, or I did this because um, I was influenced by so-and-so, you know? So he had more ownership of his decisions in that case versus if he had been exposed to those ideas beforehand and uh, before he had a chance to kind of let it settle with him within him that do I even agree with this or is this something I really want? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, it was very interesting. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Uh, do we have time for the next question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, next question. Uh, Fanny? Hi, Isra. Uh, hey! Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. I think it was, um, I think it was great. Um, I did have a question. So I engage in a lot of like uh, political debates online, often, actually, a little too often, to be honest. But um, a lot, something that you see, especially when you're discussing gender and um, how it's a social construct, something that you see a lot, people refer to this study that was done in London where they brought like little kids, like, I mean, infants, you know, boys and girls, and they placed like an array of toys in front of them, um, trucks, cars, um, balls, things like that. And then they placed like dolls in front of them too. And so what they found is uh, like the overwhelming amount of like all the kids, all the babies really uh, chose toys that are associated with their gender. So the girl, like the girls would choose the dolls and then the boys would like more often than not choose the trucks. So I just wanted to know what you, I don't know if you've heard about that, but I just wanted to know what your thoughts on that are. So um, in my opinion, I haven't read of that study, but I feel like um, it remind me the age group again. Which age group were those infants at? It was from nine months to like two years, I think. Let me check. Because it, it depends on the age group of when we actually start forming uh, the gender bias or when we actually start identifying with a certain gender or not. And then it goes down to the understanding of, okay, 
did they have access to media which influenced their decision in terms that um, normally when when you put on uh, Disney for kids or whatever there there's always this uh, blue and pink uh, association of okay girls always get trucks with flowers on it they're they're always pink they're always yeah. um, girly and the guys have these thunderbolts on it with these shocking bright colors of like yellow and blue and uh, those more masculine colors yeah. and, and those are all portrayed in the cartoons themselves so it would depend on what kind of access did the kids have beforehand or mm -hmm. was it completely isolated and then based off of that they kind of made their decision because like I said gender studies have shown that gender is not an expression of self it is the self so mm -hmm. it took me a minute to understand this as well, but now that I understand it, it kind of makes a bit sense that, okay, it's not me expressing myself, it is me. And when I'm interacting with others, uh, the way my gender plays into my identity is how I relate to things around me, how I choose my preferences, how I decide how I want to talk, who I want to talk to, in what manner do I want to talk to, and so on. Great, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, okay, let me ask you that. Well, yeah, I, I guess this idea of implicit bias, um, I, I think on some level it speaks to the impressionable nature of, of, of human beings, um, especially, again, when they're young. And I believe you're, you're making these, these very points. Um, don't get me wrong. But again, uh, you know, we're very malleable. Um, uh, again, and we develop habits beginning at a very young age, and they're not just habits of action, they're habits of thought. Um, and I believe that's where the bias comes in. And so if, if if we agree, and we don't have to, but for the sake of argument, if we agree that that sort of Im impressionistic nature is part of human nature, um, and we also want to agree, yeah, perhaps habits of explicit, and if, thank you, Jen, that's a good point. And also, if uh, if we also want to agree that well, implicit biases are something that need to be eliminated. Um, how does one eliminate the emergence of these biases when we're just so unalterably impressionable? It seems like maybe the the solution would be something like heavy censorship or something along these lines. Because to, to a point you made in your presentation, I remember again all of the the shows where there was cursing on television and stuff like that, yeah, they occurred later at night because that's when children are asleep. And sometimes if there was a broadcast of something very serious happening in the country uh, that was kind of violent, perhaps, or scary, they would say, you know, take your children. They would say it on the broadcast, take your children out of the room. We, so, so again, there is these sort of protective measures we find in society and in the media. But, I mean, is it something that can never really be solved or just managed, I guess? So we're we're looking at. Uh, I guess I failed to portray this, or because that wasn't the focus of my um, talk right now, was that um, implicit bias isn't the enemy. Implicit bias is, like I said, an interpretation of how we filter content and how we interact with other people and how we engage with our environment. So you can never take it away. Um, to be a human is to interpret and to think and to basically say what we think. And if we take that ability away or that implicit bias away, I feel like a half of human personality is just gonna be ro robotic in terms that we're not gonna be able to process or filter out some information and just think, is this a right time or is this appropriate to say even in front of X, Y, Z person. So implicit bias is not the enemy. The enemy is our lack of understanding that uh, we all have fallen victim to implicit bias or using implicit bias in wrong situations. So it's the ability to identify that, okay, I have this bias. I'm aware that I have this bias. What can I do to make sure that this bias doesn't impede my ability to judge appropriately or impede my ability to make the right choice? And like the example that I shared, that there's a hiring manager and um, he has this implicit bias of, okay, a white man is the best man for the job because it's a higher um, responsibility position. Women can't handle responsibility and especially women from ethnic backgrounds aren't able to uphold their responsibility or liability of the company and so on and so forth. And based off of that is what he made the choice of saying that, okay, even though he's a bit underqualified, I'd rather go with him because I know what I'm going into 
instead of going into with these women where I don't know the risk factor and I don't know how well would they perform, even though their track record is on their resume, even though their accomplishments and successes are all in front of him. But he would still choose to go with a white man because he's got this bias towards him that, no, if I'm excellent at it, somebody else would be too. Somebody who looks like me, who talks like me, who's with a similar background as me would have the same morale, morales at me or same uh, motivations at me as me. So um, that's where the implicit bias or becoming aware of knowing that you have implicit biases is, is what I argue that we should be aware of um, in terms of circumstances that uh, affect other people or impact people other than ourselves. Because like I said, implicit bias is a way for us to um, kind of get the uh, extra stuff out of the way and ha give our brains less time for processing so we can do things faster and more efficiently because that's human brain. That's why we basically develop the biases in the first place. But to be aware of them and know that is this the right place and time for it to be active right now is where we need to make the conscious choice of what are my biases and how are my how is it going to affect somebody else? Yeah, I think that was a fantastic response. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with the idea that, you know, implicit bias is something that, uh, yeah, isn't necessarily, again, a quote unquote bad thing. But, but again, it's it's tough to talk about it as, as though it's not. Again, even using your words, you know, you fall victim to it. That sounds like it's a bad thing. It impedes you. That sounds like it's a it's a bad thing. But um, but yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, OK, so it's uh, it's 11 a.m. So our next presenter. Adiyam Jabrewat is not present, but our 11 or 1045 presenter is. So, Bob, if you'd like to present now, um, literary, literary analysis to guest, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, yes, I think I'm ready for it. Awesome. Um, yeah, feel free to begin. All right. Uh, so, can I start now? Uh huh. So, Albert Camus, 1913-1960, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1957, was a French Algerian journalist, novelist, and intellectual philosopher. Most of Camus' works are principally my mirror and absurdism. However, spending the word used in Paris, the French resistance had affected him with the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre who was one of those first philosophers to state the theory of existentialism. Although both absurdism and existentialism agree that the universe is inherently meaningless, existentialism states that people must create their meaning. The existentialist mantra is existence precedes and since we are born, we exist, and then we must choose to craft our own and sense, our own purpose, Absurdism, on the other hand, focuses on the tension between the meaningless universe and our constant striving to, to find meaning. Through the main character, Daru, the guest of Campbell's reflects the philosophical idea of absurdism and existentialism by exploring the human isolated condition he delineated the despair of Daru, second in the life to create his own value in the meaning universe. The story describes the indecisiveness in Daru characteristics based on his situation. The setting in which the story takes place introduced the concept of absurdism. The schoolhouse was built on a remote mountain that we went through a drought and a blizzard. The isolate was produced by the clammy and the frigid atmosphere. Which is a result of a blizzard. The main character is Daru living alone on the cold mountain surrounded by the, a vast plateau. The schoolhouse is solitude from almost everywhere else, but Daru enjoyed this play. But Daru had been born here. Everywhere else, he felt exiled. The background describes the isolate of the schoolhouse and Daru's loneliness. The statement, he who lives almost like a monk in his remote schoolhouse, nonetheless satisfied with the little he had and the rough lie, he had felt like a lot with his whitewashed walls, show solido as Daru is a character who can find no meaningful purpose in his life. The story historical context brought Daru into an absurd situation. 
a philosophy holding that human exists in a meaningless, irrational universe, and that any search for order by them will bring them into direct conflict with this universe. Albert Camus wrote this story on the eve of the outbreak of Algeria War, War revolt began October 31, 1954, that was led by the National Liberation Front and ended in 1962 when Algeria achieved independence. Applying this concept in the gas, there is placed in an absurd position. During this sensitive period, he acknowledged that whatever he does, his behavior will be misapprehended. Misapprehended because this a time of the up, uprising, the NX are repeatedly misconstrued by revealing the Badgie order. His behavior can be misunderstood as a contradiction with the governments. However, that reacts in the way he does not in this way because he does not want to get involved in political issue and he does what he believes is right. So he decided against the demand, which not many people would be brave enough to do. When the old Kurdistan Badgi brings a prisoner to Daru and asks him to take the prisoner to the police headquarters at Tingwil for the next day because the revolt is brewing, Daru refused to be a transporter because he can tends that he is a teacher, not a policeman. But then Badgi says, what? What is the meaning of that? In the wartime, people do all kinds of jobs. After that, Badoji leaves the, the era for Daru and goes back to El Amur. Uh, when Badoji departs, Daru lies on his cap, wondering the absurdity of situation. The era's murder has never been clarified, even if he killed his cousin. Nonetheless, he indirectly becomes the one on holding another destiny, which he finds himself in. Furthermore, according to the analysis of Brad Barton from my writing, the situation in which the Arab was accused of killing his cousin can be considered as an absurdity. Uh, when the Arab and Badji first arrive, Daru makes them some tea. At the same time, he asks Badji what the Arab had done to be arrested. Badji answers that he murdered his cousin in a family squabble and further says that they hide him. Thus, it took a month to find him. The word they in the sentence can be understood as his relatives within his family. This little detail makes reader creating the situation because if someone in our family kills any member within it the other members will announce for the police to arrest that person but they help the arab hide from the law in this situation therefore Barton reveals the irony of the arab's condition that his murder was justified because his family support and conceal him from the police he was arrested by according not to Arab laws that he lives in, but accused by French colonial laws. Although the Arab did kill his cousin, Daru understands that the Arab action is not guilty in Arab laws and realizes it is just misconcept. Since the Arab cannot speak French, he is unable to clarify the reason for his action. This is the prime example of absurdism, which shows how man is silent in the cosmos that he exists a part of, trying to be free and just, but condemned by his existence. Additionally, understand Daru's perspective, absurdity appears when the Arab chooses in prison instead of freedom. However, with Arab position, his decision is not absurd at all. According to Krim, he approaches the situation the issue in a different direction. When Daru asks him why he kills his cousin, the Arab answer, he ran away. I ran after him. Taking another point of view in Brad Norton from my writing, it said that to be questioned individual, this seemed like premeditated murder, but, um, but what 
can we make of this reply if we try to take it seriously? Could it be that the cousin act of running away instead of taking full responsibility in the family's wobble over a death of grain constitute a complete loss of his honor and a serve injury to the family honors as well? In his own indigenous culture and could it be that the prisoner is running after him possibly because he was the first to notice or the one with the best starting position as pursuer and then killing him was merely acting in accordance with his own tribal custom from this view, uh, the action of the arab murder his cousin is not wrong we now understand why he does not choose freedom because running away like his cousin seems to be an admission that he did wrong and now he has to hide for not being arrested in other words understanding the circumstance regret is a perfectly incongruous meaningless kind of response instead Indeed, from this perspective, Arab sees himself guiltless. So, what is the point? Has to run away. Absurdism was illustrated by the prisoner as he was inserted in an absurd situation. Absurdism is a part of the existentialism. Besides some absurd details, existentialism is actually a big picture of the whole story. And the story, this philosophical theory was exposed in the form of choices and decisions of character, which reason can easily recognize the content of the story surrounded with the selections. When Badochi brings the Arab to the school hall and asks Daru to turn the Arab for the police headquarters at Tingwo the next day, Daru feels disgust with the order and tells Badochi that he will not follow the demand. By refusing the order, Daru makes a choice that not many people would usually take. In his mind, Daru knew that later he might be punished because of his decision. He decides to act in what he believes is right. This is an illustration that Kamut used to emphasize the meaningless of existence, that he believed that there is no choice is right is the right choice. In the story, Daru examines examines the man moral responsibilities and believe it is wrong to turn in prisoner to authorities yet he realized that opposing the command may cause him trouble and he resigned the decision for arab this detail was so in the paragraph 22 which daryl thinks that the arab will escape at the night while he is sleeping Nevertheless, unlike his thought, the Arab did not run away. So in the next morning, he left the prisoner the responsibility for choosing his own way. The reason that led the schoolmaster not to turn the Arab for the authorities because Daru does not want to condemn the man. In addition, Camus wants to use Daru as a character to reveal the theory of existentialism, which says, uh, existentialism is a philosophical theory that are free agents who have control over their own choices and actions. Existentialists believe that society should not restrict an individual's life or action that these restrictions inhibit free will and the development of the person potential. Hence, Daru, instead of deciding the fate for the Arab, Daru gives the Arab the responsibility to choose that what he wants. Now look, the schoolmaster say, as he pointed in the direction of the east, there is a way to Tingu. Uh, you have two hour work at Tingu. You have fight the administration and the police. They are expecting you. The Arab looks toward the east, still holding a package and the money again his chest. Daru took his elbow and turned him rather roughly toward the south. At the foot of the high on which they stood could be seen a fan pad. That's a trail across the plateau. In the day walk from here, you find the pasture lane and the first nomads that will take you in and shelter you according to their law. By letting the Arab decide his own fate, Daru presses the idea of existentialism that no one allows to restrict other freedom and all potential to develop. In the end, uh, Daru leaves the Arab free and asks him to make a choice whether he wants to go to the police or wants to go in 
direction where he will be free forever. Arab chooses the prison. The ending is ironic because more often prisoners choose to be free, but he had chosen the prison. Ending also depicts the loneliness of and fear of Daryl. Uh, his loneliness was described when the story ends with Daryl looking out the window of his schoolhouse. The message right on the blackboard was also threatening. You have turned in our brother, you will pay. The message on the blackboard is also an illustration of existentialism theory, which shows that uh, no matter what Daryl does, the result will never be predicted. Although he, ha he, he acts based on his faith, uh, with other his decisions can be misunderstood. The last message on the blackboard perhaps was written by one of the members in the Arab family to threaten that rule because of making a wrong decision. The Guest is a successful fiction story by Albert Scammott that reflects both the theory of absurdism and existentialism through the interact of the three character, although the author denies being existentialist during the during his literary career, most of his writing are quite similar with other major writers such as Augustin, Pascal, and Sartre, Sartre, which probably concentrate on the human in the life of cons conscience and spry of people who actually live and experience. Uh, my presentation is done. Hey, thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting work by uh, Albert Camus, the guest. It's a, for those who aren't aware, it's a short work of fiction, uh, but Camus is a major existentialist or postmodern thinker. And yeah, I really like how you analyze it. I really like how you brought out the idea of absurdity. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, again, great job. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to field questions for you. We have to move on yeah. to the next presentation. But yes. yeah, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, okay, so our next presenter, I believe uh, she's in the room, uh, Christine uh, Zakwai. Is that correct? The Dilemma of Intelligent Design. Very fascinating. Let's see if Christine is here. I know she was here earlier. Yeah, Christine, I see you're in the room. Um, feel free to present whenever you're ready. Oh, she's setting up the camera, okay. Um, cool, well, okay, while Christine gets uh, prepared, I, I will kind of respond a little bit then to that last presentation. Um, again, I, I appreciated the, the emphasis on, again, showing how a work of fiction can show us something about what is real. That's kind of a funny idea. How can something fake teach us about something real? Um, now, what is being taught, quote unquote, in that particular work, uh, as was brought out in the presentation, is, again, this idea of absurdity. More specifically, the notion that, and, you know, um, Isra, she just left, but she referenced nihilism in one of her responses when she was building questions. But absurdism, absurdism is this idea that, you know, if, if the world is inherently meaningless, which is nihilism, well, then perhaps attempts to find meaning are absurd. As well as the idea that, well, perhaps we can embrace the absurdity once we sort of accept it. It's less of an endurance and more of an, as I said, acceptance. That's a, uh, that's a very difficult lesson, I think, to teach in the abstract, to just teach theoretically. And I think Camus felt the same way, which is why he wrote works of fiction, uh, to try to convey that very existential point. Existentialism, again, it emphasizes the individual and, and, and individual value. So yeah, thanks again for that presentation. How are we doing, Christine? <laughs> Hi, yes, um, I'm ready. Uh... Great. Um, do you know how to share the screen or will you be needing to? Um, yeah, it's just really, my computer's really slow, sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Is the screen being shared? Um, no. Um, okay. Sorry. That's okay. okay. How about now? No dice. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm pressing share screen, but it's not coming. Um. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the correct button. Okay. All right, here, I'll try um, emailing one of you guys and then I will share with you. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, let me see here. Orlando, are you there? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm here. Can Christine email you her presentation and you can share it for her? She's having trouble sharing your screen. Fine. I'm um, putting my email in the chat here. Cool. Yeah, you can let me know when it, uh, whenever you've sent it. I like the build up. I'm I'm excited about this particular uh, topic and this presentation. Thanks. And then uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm. Yeah. No, no worries. Not a big deal. And then coming up after Christine is um, our first guest speaker, uh, Dr. Julie Leventhal. So she'll be presenting on human trafficking. Is it truly wicked? And wicked is, is going to be a technical term that she's going to sort of hash out for us. Um, and she is a professor at the University of North Texas at Denton. Um, she teaches specifically in the Honors College. And she has, um, well, I mean, you can check out her, uh, her bio in our conference program. It's about 9,000 words. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, listen, I mean, while we're dealing with these, uh, oh, hey. Bing, pow, boom. And yeah, feel free to begin. And I guess you could just tell Orlando um, when to change slides for you. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, okay. Is the whole thing loading for you guys? I just see like half of the like slide. I mean, I see the whole slide. Okay. Yeah, I see all right. All right. It's fine. I'll just pull it up on my phone. So, um, I'm Christine. My topic is um, the dilemma of intelligent design. Um, it will just be a, like a brief overview of, of uh, several uh, different theories uh, regarding intelligent design. So um, you can go on to the next slide, please. All right. So yeah. So it's nothing new. Um, it's it's uh, it's a very I guess like heated debate um, between like even even politics today, like church and state. Um, but we can go back and the origins of it. We'll be discussing like. Um, uh, modern researchers who um, are actually proponents of it and then um, several people who uh, believed in it like centuries ago. Okay, next, please. All right, so um, intelligent design basically claims that the universe can be, um, the features of the universe are not like coincidental, that uh, it suggests that there is a higher entity and and with this higher entity um there are living organisms such as us like humans that um are defined as irreducibly complex so what does that mean it basically means that all of our parts such as like our eyes our ears um without one of these certain parts then the, the function of them will basically it will be functionless basically it will be useless and so um, some modern proponents of this uh, intelligent design today um, include researchers at the um, Discovery Institute Center of Science and Culture, and they're actually based, I think, in um, Washington. And um, there are several professors that actually uh, advocate for this. Um, it includes Michael Behe, Philip E. Johnson, and William Dempsey here at Baylor University or in Texas, I guess. Okay, so next. All right, so um, in, in intelligent design infers that um, the system of parts such as our human body is created uh, at a single event. So it basically um, clashes with 
Darwin Darwinism's uh, theory, I guess, on like natural selection and mutation. And um, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding, I guess, because uh, those of faith do challenge Darwin's theory because uh, the Bible, I guess, suggests that the creation of the universe uh, happened all at um, a single event. But um, it could be de debated that, well, you know, the Earth or I guess the universe was created in the, in the span of seven days. So some do say that, you know, the clash between um, science and religion is you know, could be like more overblown out of proportion than it actually really is. And um, yeah, so I provided some images right there just um, about the topic. And um, the so intelligent design actually is um, really aligned with uh, traditional creationism. And what that basically means is it's a little bit more of, um, aligned with the Bible, I guess, and um, in the in Genesis, where where the previous example of um, the universe being created this over the span of seven days. And uh, we basically say that's divine intervention. So intelligent design today is a little bit more advanced and complex than that. And then we can go into the next slide as to why. Okay, so um, the reason why it is heavily criticized is because it's called a pseudoscience. There's not really much um, mathematical evidence as to why. A lot of it is just um, based on a lot of philosoph philosophic thought and um, I guess faith. So it seems to clash with a lot of uh, mathematicians and scientists and physicists. Next. Okay, so um, more on one of the professors that actually are, is a proponent of this school of thought. So his name is Michael Behe. He um, basically coined the term irreducible complexity. Um, and um, in his book that he wrote in 1996, uh, he describes three human parts that are unexplainable and natural means. So um, with these parts, he basically found that um, these parts, they ha must be fully formed at once to serve their full purpose. So if one of the parts um, goes missing, then the overall part is um, basically uh, functionless. So for example, the human, for example, the human eye. So um, if the retina of, or a lens of the human eye is um, missing, then the human eye is just like, uh, I guess, purposeless. And um, that, that school of thought basically challenges how um, natural selection uh, occurs over time. So with Michael Behe's thought on irreducible complexity, we can see that um, it, the timeline just doesn't make sense, I guess. And um, a lot of critics have to say that um, that this is a mischaracterization of biological mutation, basically. And um, that evolution isn't a linear progress as, you know, over time due to like uh, environmental circumstances, some conditions um, that, or natural selection, I guess, that um, that this uh, that these um, processes are are not are spontaneous. Um, they don't necessarily go in a straight line across the across time. And then um, uh, yeah. So next slide, please. Okay. So um, here's a quote by Michael Behe. So he says, uh, since natural selection can only choose systems that are already working then if a biological system cannot be produced gradually, it would have to arise as an integrated unit in one fell swoop for natural selection to have anything to act upon. So yeah, that basically just describes what I said earlier about um, how the human eye is basically like functionless, uh, functionless if one part of it weren't to be, weren't to be working. Okay, and next. Okay, so another theory you guys probably are familiar with is the watchmaker theory by William Paley. So in his book, Natural Theology, he um, says uh, he says that there cannot be design without a designer. And um, in this book, he actually uh, wrote many biological descriptions of like uh, the purpose of like the eye as well, and then like blood circulation, veins, um, like the legs, uh, many areas of the body. And he basically says um, that it's also not coincidental 
that all of these parts um, serve a purpose for the overall uh, environment that it, it is in. And um, yeah, and then the next theory uh, is by Corey Jewell, fine tuning argument. Oh, sorry, next slide. So Corey Jewell, he is, uh, he's actually a professor at UT and um, he proposed that as a result of what we know from physics and physics fundamentals that the way the world fits together is uh, suggests, suggests an intelligent creator. So um, two hypotheses here. So if there is a God, then there is no surprise that the universe is the way that it is. However, if there isn't that the chance of producing this, uh, like this mathematically perfect universe, I guess, is um, is very slim. It's like slim to none. So um, because of the latter option, it, it, it being like very impossible, I guess there should be an inference that there is a creator. So um, a lot of people do debate on um, this argument, and most of them come from uh, physicists. And they say that there is an improbability of, um, of, so they explain that because there is such a slim chance that um, there could actually be multiple universes. Uh, so they're, they're like the values that the world is um, created upon, that they're actually produced randomly across the universe. So there's not so there's not just one universe that is um, as a result of this like accidental perfection that there's uh, potentially many universes that are out there so yeah all right well thank you very much christine that was uh, that was fantastic very interesting um i'm glad we we solved those technical issues uh definitely definitely fantastic presentation um, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we cannot field questions for you. Uh, but as I said, at the end of every presentation, if you'd like to engage the speaker on the topic, feel free or, or engage everybody else who is present. Feel free to take the conversations over to the chat, as has been happening. And um, of course, feel free to message them directly uh, if you want to have a, a conversation that isn't taking up the chat. But either way is fine. OK, um, so next up is uh, one of our guest speakers, our first guest speaker of the conference. Dr. Julie Leventhal. Her presentation is entitled Human Trafficking. Is it truly wicked? And again, wicked is going to take on a technical term uh, meaning, so she will be breaking it down for us. Um, she teaches at the University of North Texas, specifically in the Honors College. And uh, yeah, I won't waste any more time. Um, I will turn it over to her. So please, Julie, whenever you're ready. Yes, not not wicked like, oh yeah, human trafficking is totally cool and, and things like that. And also not wicked like, the Maze Runner series or other other frames of references uh, that you could make with that. Hold on, let me get my presentation up. Oh. So this definitely does not want to share the PowerPoint. Let's see. Nope, nope, we're good. We are good. Cool. Um Oops, hold on, I'm trying to see if I can also see the chat at the same time, which I can't, so hold on. I'm used to Zoom, not Teams, so. Welcome to the magical world of Teams. <laughs> oh, I know. Okay, well, I'm just not gonna see the chat, so y'all maybe speak out loud when I ask you the question that I'm totally gonna ask you in just a sec. Um, all right, so hi, I'm Julie. I'm gonna briefly run through what human trafficking is and then get to this really cool kind of uh, interpretation or perspective on what's known as wicked problems. And I thought that it connected really well um, just because it's kind of a fascinating idea here. So for those of you who are not sure of human trafficking or what it is, um, this is modern day slavery and basically the, the easiest way to describe it of a sense. Um, and I'm going to give you kind of like technical terms with this, and there's going to be a lot of information on these slides, but I'm not going to obviously read everything directly. Oh, Julie, Julie, yeah. Julie, you need to uh, share the screen again. Oh, oh my goodness, seriously? Urgh. Okay. I'm not sure. Let's see if I just share. Do you need me to help? Um, I don't know. No, you got it. You're there. So is it showing up on here? Yes. Cool. So that's weird, though. 
because okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it still working? Yes. Beautiful. Okay. I'm just going to, we're going to trust it. If it's not, just nudge me again. Okay. So human trafficking is modern day slavery. Um, the biggest aspect of it, of, of what is considered human trafficking um, is this little comment here of force, fraud, and coercion. That's your clear cut definition of human trafficking. Um, we could spend an entire like four hours just talking about prostitution versus exploitation versus a million other terms. Um, but it has to have these components, force, fraud, and coercion. And so you get into a big debate here in terms of what actually um, classifies being trafficked. But if you see any of that occurring, it is hardcore defined as human trafficking. Um, you see this being done both in labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Those are our big broad categories, even though sex trafficking is a type of labor trafficking. It just basically means that there's lots of different ways that people control other people. Um, so involuntary servitude or debt bondage, for instance, is telling someone, hey, I have a really good job opportunity for you. You should come over to the U.S. or you should come to my state or wherever it is, and you should clean my house for me. And then when you get here, maybe I've paid for you to come over. And when you get here, I take your passport, I take your information, I take all of your um, personal items. And then I say, oh, well, I paid for you to come here. So technically you owe me $2,000 now, and I'm going to start charging interest as well. And so that's considered involuntary servitude where you are forced to pay that off in some sort of way. There's a whole bunch of different estimates here. Um, the United Nations, our Department of State, a um, whole bunch of different organizations, but basically there's a lot of slavery happening everywhere. So I'm gonna ask some questions here. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to tab into the chat so I can see. Okay, can you still see my slide even though I'm in the chat right now? Or are you seeing my browser and see your browser because you're sharing oh, your okay cool well I'll, I'll tab back so um or y'all can talk out loud too because i want to see if you have answers to these does anybody even know what kind of car that blue car is <laughs> because i know that i put a car here that's probably outside of like everybody I think it's a lamborghini it is a lamborghini does anybody know how much that cost on average like half a million dollars maybe yep about 450 to half a million. Okay, uh, just frame a reference there. Our lovely iPhone in the middle. For those of you who own an iPhone, or you can have any other phone, what's the average price of a phone? Is this like about $1,200? Like how much? $1,200. $1,200? Yeah, to go high end. When it should be like 20 bucks, but I mean, sure. Yeah. <laughs> right, it should be something very different than it actually is. Um, this, I think when I pulled this up, it was like $900 on average, but I mean, y'all know phones range usually anywhere from 500 to yeah, 1200. Um, anybody check recently and granted, I know it's different because of the pandemic, but how much like Cowboys tickets are and you can insert any, um, any, any sports teams. Like we go to stars games all the time. So any sports teams, how much do tickets normally cost? On the third market or retail? Ooh, let's do retail. I don't know if face value changed because of the pandemic. They were 300 in the 100 section when I was there last Yeah, year. 300 bucks for a ticket. You can get like standing room tickets for maybe like 20 or 30 for the Cowboys, but then, you know, you're paying for parking, which is like 60 bucks and you're paying for food. There's, there's a lot, but if you want like fairly normal seat, not normal seats, but not nosebleed seats, you're paying a couple hundred bucks. And then anybody know how much this makeup eyeshadow palette costs? Because this is a, Common concern for people who wear eyeshadow, or anybody want to take a guess? I don't know. Eight, forty, <laughs> dollars, forty-five dollars, thirty. It's it retails for fifty-four, but sometimes you can get discounts. But it's yeah, anywhere from like thirty-five to fifty-five, which is kind of expensive for eyeshadow. Okay, so frame of mind here. So I've just told you all these different prices on stuff. Um, it costs $90 to purchase a human, okay? So, like, let that sit in for a sec, that we just talked about the fact that an iPhone costs hundreds of dollars, and for $90, you can purchase a human being. That's the cost of a slave these days. That's the cost of human trafficking for an individual. And it is insane when you think about that comparatively to these luxury items to then value a human life at so much less money. So that, that's why 
human trafficking is such a big thing. Um, talking about it's such a big thing, and then framing it in this context that I'm going to frame it today is also um, pretty, pretty valuable. Um, this just gives you a little bit of background information of the types of trafficking. I, I teach a whole 16-week course on this, so cramming this into a small time period, um, I'm just kind of trying to give you main points here. Um, but you typically see this in domestic type of work. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing you on to clean my house, to um, do my landscaping. Um, you'll also see um, sex trafficking, like I said, is partly related to labor trafficking. It's a type of labor trafficking. You'll see um, illicit massage companies are actually, even though they're, they're second ranked here, are usually the biggest ones, especially abroad. Um, pornography has been growing in terms of a type of trafficking, especially in the pandemic. Um, moving this on to like a digital kind of context has been um, increasing. And then there's a lot of different ways that people recruit into trafficking. So um, I think, you know, we normally think of the Liam Neeson movie, Taken, and we're like, oh yeah, you're totally gonna get kidnapped from an airport in a country that you don't know. And that is actually not really what happens. Um, what happens more times than not is either some sort of false advertisement. So I have a really good job opportunity for you. You just have to pay a little bit of money and give me your documents and then that'll work. Or you also, especially with sex trafficking, see what's called the um, the good boyfriend phenomenon, where a person will actually groom you and treat you as if they truly, truly care about you. And they'll do this for anywhere up to like three months to an entire year, gaining your trust. And then we'll end up trafficking you once they've kind of wrangled you in. Um, you'll also see some family um, that does unfortunately happen, which we'll kind of touch on in just a bit. Um, where family members may think that they're sending someone into a lucrative job opportunity and then they're being trafficked or they really have ultimately no choice um, and they're paying back some sort of debt and there's some sort of not necessarily kidnapping but some sort of under the table trading of a human basically. Um, some things to just kind of give you frame of reference before I get into talking about wicked problems. When I say social determinants that's basically meaning like social influences, things that are really going to be a catalyst for trafficking. Poverty obviously is one of the biggest ones. It's tied into economic issues. Um, Y'all are probably familiar with this because we're dealing with poverty everywhere at any given time here. Not having access to clean water, not having access to electricity, um, not having access to food and shelter a lot of times means that families or individuals will barter for those services. So we hear about this a lot um, in the trans community, for instance, um, if, a, if a teenager, young adult gets kicked out of a house and they're on the streets, they're homeless, and they're basically ending up selling sex in order to have some sort of shelter or get food. That's one small example of how you see this playing out in a lot of different ways. Anytime that we have economic issues in a country, if there's massive population growth or migration, um, you see this actually a lot in um, Europe. Um, so I, I do most of my work over in Romania in this area, and you see a lot of like the Roma populations moving uh, rapidly from one country to another into Greece, out of Greece, um, into different parts of Central and uh, Western Europe, and you get a lot of instability there. Government systems shift, the infrastructure shifts, and so it becomes this, this imbalance, and so people will very quickly jump on an opportunity um, of some sort of lucrative employment or something like that in order to hopefully make more money and carve out a better life. There's also these push-pull variables. We mentioned this um, in our field quite a bit. It's, you know, you're pushed into one area and you're pulled out of another area as well. Um, poverty is this kind of chain reaction to different things. And this means that individuals are seeking out opportunities, families are seeking out opportunities, and this idea that everyone has to contribute in some, some way. And some of you might have been raised in environments like that as well, where you were expected at a very early age to work or to contribute to the family. And I'm not saying that you were trafficked or anything like that, but there was some sort of contribution that you needed to make given your role within that family unit. Gender is also an issue, and we could, again, spend like hours just talking about this. Um, even though trafficking victims are not only women, a lot of times they're seen as this commodity. They're very easy to replace. They can just be sold time and time and time again. Um, they should be very subservient and not really speak up and not fight back. Um, and there's a lot of victim blaming that comes in this as well in terms of saying, well, you know, if you just dress differently, then this person wouldn't have been interested in you and then you wouldn't have been trafficked, which is a horrible, horrible train of thought. Um, we also have race and ethnicity. I mean, hello, U.S., and hello, other countries um, that have this long-standing history of racism and um, 
segregation and slavery and things like that. Um, you'll see this notion of othering, which is what we had here in the US, where we took an entire population, an entire race, an entire ethnic group and said, they are not the same level as everybody else. Um, and then you also get issues like colorism in other countries where there's a lot of um, diversity in terms of ethnic groups. Um, and, and that ties into culture, this next point that because of these inherent belief systems that exist within the country that oftentimes allows people or creates this kind of notion of, hey, we are superior and these other groups of individuals aren't. And as a result, those who are deemed more inferior are the ones who are often trafficked. You'll also see some cultural rituals. Um, the Devadasi, for instance, is basically like um, women get sold to the priesthood in India. Um, or you'll see a lot of things. I, I have a colleague who does a lot of work with um, the caste system and hierarchies um, in certain parts of the world where oftentimes this bonded labor or this trafficking mentality is inherited from the parents. So as a result that my parents were in this system and they were, were servants to this family, I now also have to serve in that role as well. So that takes us to this really, really cool kind of philosophical and theoretical underpinning from the 70s. So I just want you to think about this as I'm going through this, that this was created in 1973. So think about what was going on during that time period. We were kind of at like the uh, still going through some civil rights stuff because of the 60s, like we're still definitely going through it in the 70s. Um, there was this like whole cultural free movement happening with a whole bunch of other things. So it's really fascinating to think of it historically from this frame point. But basically we have this idea of wicked problems. Has anybody ever heard of this before? Wicked problems? This like theory or this idea? Yes. Yes. Yeah, oh, cool. Because no one, no one ever when I teach these classes has heard of it. It's basically this fact that we have this problem and like they're, it's unsolvable. And so I thought about this with human trafficking because it's really interesting because trafficking, yes, can be solved, but also on the other hand, can it really though? If you think of it as this wicked problem. Now this comes out of urban policy and like or urban planning and policy analysis, um, but it's been applied to a lot of different areas. So there's 10 criteria here. First off, there's like no, no specific formulation of this wicked problem. Like you have to know what the solutions are in order to really understand the problem which we don't necessarily know with human trafficking. We don't really, we have some ideas of the solutions, but we don't know if they're gonna work and we don't know if it actually will make sense. There's also no stopping rule. So there's no like end point, you know, like when you do a math problem and you're like, cool, I solved for X, the end, I got it. Wicked problems don't have that end goal. It's kind of like a moving target. So it makes it really hard to reach that solution. We also don't have like right or wrong solutions. It's just kind of, oh, this is an okay solution and maybe this is like a lesser okay one. It's gonna be based on perceptions and judgments that the individuals involved in creating the solution actually have. We also don't really have a test of the solution. So there's long-term outcomes and y'all have probably seen this in a lot of different ways. I mean, think about if you like struggle on a paper in a class. Okay, well that might impact you in this semester, but it also might impact you in your next class that you take next semester and then in four years for your career and so on and so on and so on. So there's no like immediate test. I can't double check my work. If I do a puzzle, I can see that all the pieces are there and I can test that the solution happened. We don't necessarily have this with trafficking because consequences are so long lasting and multi-generational. We also, for a wicked problem, it deems that every Every solution is this one shop opportunity. Every single solution is going to impact individuals and have some sort of consequence or penalty. A math problem, again, you solve it, the end. You solve it wrong, it's not really gonna hurt anybody. You have another try to get it right. Solving human trafficking, if you mess up, you've probably impacted quite a few people. Um, our sixth point here is there's no set of potential solutions. We don't really have a guide of what works and what doesn't. You actually see this, and I wish I had more time to talk about it. There's different models for how to address prostitution, for instance, like the Nordic model over in Sweden, which is very cool. Um, it deals with decriminalizing some stuff. Um, but the, it's kind of like it works there, but it doesn't work in other countries. So there's not like a here's the right answer, here's the wrong answer or this this is good, this isn't. Um, you see this a lot of times actually with trafficking where we have a pimp 
And yeah, we arrest that person, but then they get off with no consequence because they've turned over the name of the person above them, or they've, they've, you know, worked out some sort of agreement. So that's considered permissible to a degree. I say that with quotes, if you can't see my fingers, like it's permissible, even though we normally wouldn't think that it should or could be. Every wicked problem is unique. So even though we might've solved slavery, which didn't fully solve slavery, but even though we've addressed slavery in the past, and we still have slavery nowadays, there are still subtle nuances and things that are different from one time period to another. Every problem is a symptom of another problem. I think this is like the biggest piece of this, um, especially in the trafficking realm. Um, there's always something else. There's always government corruption. There's always economic instability. There's always political issues. There's always something else that is a catalyst and also a response from trafficking. Um, there's also multiple ways that we can explain human trafficking and that we can describe this. Um, we think about the terms in what makes most sense to us. So if I've had personal experience with human trafficking, I'm gonna describe it very differently than you might, depending on our experiences. So our perception and our judgment is very different. And this last point, the planner has no right to be wrong. <coughs> this is a really interesting one. Because um, it's, it's the idea that <coughs> we're really aiming to change the world in some sort of way to improve something. And if the solution doesn't work, the public is not going to be cool with that. Right. I mean, I mean, think about COVID is another good example of this. Like if we fail in our response to this, the public has an outcry or there's a big issue. There's these multiple cascading consequences, as I mentioned previously. So there's not really tolerance there. Like you can't be wrong in terms of solving this problem, but you can't really be right because there's no way to actually solve the problem. All right, that's my crash course <laughs> on that. Um, I tried to go as quickly as possible to give you all time for questions, but I don't know if I succeeded there. Uh, well, yeah, thank you for that, Julie. That was fantastic. Very, um, <laughs> yeah, very, uh, very compelling. Um, unfortunately, yeah, no time for questions uh, right now in this form, but again, feel free to uh, raise questions to Julie in the chat or um, directly message her. And uh, yeah, I'm sure she'd be happy to respond. Um, but thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, great. Okay. So our next presenter, uh, Amira Omar, The Social Dilemma, which is a film, a documentary, and social media's negative impact on society. Amira, I believe you're present. Yeah, I'm here. Great. Yeah, well, feel free to um, begin your presentation whenever you're ready. So do you just want me to read off? Do you, do you just want me to read my essay? Yeah. Okay. Did you want me to screen share or is it okay if I just read it? You can read it. That's fine. Okay. So I'm speaking on the social dilemma off of actually one of my like my, my off of my philosophy class. So I'm starting off with um, Jeff Orlowski's social dilemma. So that that's kind of where I got my information from. It's kind of where I'm basing off all of my information from is just the film. So I recall seeing Jeff Orlowski's The Social Dilemma a few days after it was released and feeling that the knowledge provided in it was off in certain ways. According to what I'd learned from friends and, and read on social media, I'd have a huge breakthrough in my understanding of technology and the use of social media if I just had watched it. Despite this, the situation was reserved, reversed. In this paper, I'll explore my issues with the documentary, including how it's portrayed to the general public and how the subjects addressed are vital to a cohesive society. Since most people are now aware of the negative aspect of social media, I think it is critical to explore this analysis and study in greater depth. Since academics have previously discussed it, and the general public is aware of it, the only missing piece is a, re is a resolution that strikes a balance between what scholars claim, the, so the resources that social media have provided for us, and keeping an eye on its more competitive and risky side. All need to reap the benefits of the innovations. I'll continue to investigate how the views extracted from the social problem, which is, or the social dilemma, as well as public and scholarly viewpoints can be reconciled within objectivity. I like Social Dilemma just because of the dramatic reenactments, not because of the new data or the emphasis on exploring it. Since they did voice all the practitioners, they were able to pre present the knowledge and evidence. The documentary is more amusing than insightful in my opinion. They included a lot of information on the collection and the use of personal data, as well as advertisements portraying as is, in quotation, the main commodity for consumption, making it seem like the main problem of social media, as CBC article writer Jackson Weaver stated, pointing to ads themselves as the problem and representing them as the main issue is confusing the symptom and the cause. 
It's a ruse to hide underlying concerns that the film never fully addresses, and as a result, neither does its audience. To be honest, I believe that people are less concerned about how their data is used in relations to which advertisements, tweets, or images are displayed. People often use it as a guide or maybe a description of what they may be interested in or recommendations for other items to purchase. It's a ruse to conceal deeper issues that the film never thoroughly tackles, and as a result, neither does the audience. So to be frank, I think people care less about how their data is used in relations to which commercials, tweets, or photographs they see. People often use it as a reference, perhaps as a summary of what they may be interested in, in or as a source of recommendations. So I began to see general public desensitized to these critical viewpoints and the fact that there's simply something on Netflix devoted to an audience who would not normally challenge means or resources was both impressive and satisfying to watch. Yeah, it isn't the perfect film, but it is a start. As scholar Nessie writes in the journal article, social media is causing the youth to run an automatic mode, disconnecting us from reality and ourselves. So the impact of social media on youth mental health challenges opportunities also stated in recent years, there has been a lot of research on social media and teenage mental well-being. So dealing with depression, ADHD, anxiety, stuff of that sort. With several studies looking at whether more regular use of social media is related to different mental health problems, depression or body image, disordered eating and externalizing problems. This is sometimes, this is something every party agrees upon the public, scholars and documentary acknowledge that are pro there are problems to be addressed within the usage of, within the usage of social media and, and overexposed youth. So throughout that documentary, they touch different aspects of social media, from monetization to mental health and how it's affected by its use, including addiction, mm -hmm. fake news, data theft, political polarization caused by its misuse, exploitation of political views and election processes, began a product for advertisers, algorithms, algorithms and persuasive technology. Al AI engine engines youth, youth being exposed to risky and dangerous content and web search subjectivity. This excites me because it covers a lot of ground in one hour and a half of material. Thousands of researchers have already researched all of the previously listed topics, but when it comes to data and how it's presented in the documentary, it seems as if it's the big tech firms are still working against us. And we then become defenseless to their attacks. So furthermore, Smith M. Ken B. and Roy G. in their conference, Big Data, Privacy Issues and Public Social Media, stated that situation big data analysis is being used in the areas to build and in in evaluate profiles of us, such as for market research, targeted ads, process development, and national security. There are controversial problems since whether or not the, the knowledge gleaned is for is used for malicious purposes is solely up to the control of the big data sets. So this shows how while there while there will be I'm sorry this shows how while there will be good business who care about their goods and what they stand for thousands of others will try to take advantage of people as much as possible by using their information. So when we look at it from that angle, people cheat and dominate others for money and power all over the world. And while everybody's exposed to it, it is up to each person to understand how the internet is not safe, how we was, how we once thought it used to be, and we must be cautious about what we share, consume, and what we post. And that's the end of it. I'm sorry if I spoke too fast. I just got braces on, so I'm stumbling over my words. No, not at all. No, that was great. Um, okay, yeah. So, so thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, again. It's a very compelling documentary, um, and I thought you brought out a lot of the major points and themes on it, so thanks for that. Um, uh, so yeah, we have a, a couple more minutes before our next presentation here. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions? Uh, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with The Social Dilemma. Um, have people seen it? I haven't seen it, but I sort of get the gist of it. I did have a quick question, actually. Um, did watching the social dilemma uh, change the frequency uh, in, in which you you personally use uh, social media applications? I feel like personally, with after I after I did watch the documentary, I still kind of felt the same over social media because I do know it. Like a lot of people know that it does impact your life severely. So whether it's time consuming or if it's just like you're dealing with negative comments or negative feedback, I feel like we sh we all know that there's still negative impacts on it but it just it doesn't take up on you really unless it's to you personally it doesn't affect you a lot more than it is affecting somebody who's like getting cyberbullied or getting negative comments stuff stuff like that but i am more cautious on being on social media i am more cautious of having like a private life i don't feel like i don't i don't have the need to like 
continuously share what I'm what I'm what I'm doing or if like like congratulating somebody you know I just feel like it's better to keep your life private and just go ahead and like view whatever you want to view on social media so let's say it's like funny videos or like you're trying to look at news off of like Facebook and stuff I try to keep it low-key like that so I'm not really trying to like put my life out there it's trying to just to view just to view what's on the, the internet so I try to I try to keep myself away from stuff like that just so I don't get deep sucked into a deeper hole because with social media it's very time consuming and plus I have like I gotta go to work and I gotta do school so it's like you can't you can't have the time to you know, you got to cross off one thing off your list and it has to be something that's the least important. So I try not to get too attached to it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're, these things can do a lot of good, but they can also be very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And, and yeah, thank you for that response. Um, again, it's tough because social media is so ubiquitous. I mean, it's 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 everywhere. It, it pervades seemingly everything. So it's again, it seems like a really sort of intractable problem. Like we're we're kind of stuck in it. It might seem. So how do we manage it? How do we, I suppose, endure it or deal with? It? But um, but okay. Thank you very much. That was uh, yeah. Again, like I said, a very thought provoking presentation on a thought provoking documentary. Um, okay, so we're ready for our next presenter, uh, Aladra Wade. Elijah Wade will pre be presenting on intellectual empathy and how we see it in everyday life. An example of applied epistemology. Yeah, very intriguing title. Excited for this. Um, I believe Alondra is in the uh, in the chat here. Um, so yeah, if you're around, feel free to begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if everybody can see my screen yet. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, because I it's loading on my end. So I will be doing intellectual empathy and how we see it in everyday life. Um, my name is Alondra Wade, by the way. Um, <laughs> So for my presentation outline, I will be providing some theoretical context. Um, I will present questions. I'll ask questions to you guys. Then I will show the video. I will ask for responses to the questions and I will define intellectual empathy. Um, and then I will present a video analysis for intellectual empathy. Um, an intellectual an application of virtue is phenology. Um, first off, a virtue is a characteristic trait of something excellent. So when a lot of people hear that, they just think that it's honestly just actually everything, but it's really different things. So a virtue, um, epistemologists are at least in part concerned with describing and educating persons on habits of mind convenience of pursuing knowledge as well as sharing and encountering the beliefs of knowledge claims of others as noted by justin beer in one of his books of intellectual virtue a fully or brutally virtuous person can be counted on to care deeply about goods like truth knowledge evidence rationality and understanding and out of all of this with emerge other traits like um intellectual humility, intellectual courage, intellectual empathy, intellectual perseverance. So virtue epistemology is not just theoretical. It includes the practical element because it has the aim of generating guidance for us as knowers. And this was quoted by Dr. Susan Carrillo. So before I show you the video, I want to ask questions that will just have you thinking while you're seeing the video. Um, so this is Kirsten over here, and this is OG. Um, they will be talking basically about 
the situation that is happening. And so I want you to think, how would you describe Kirsten's interactive style and her as a person? And how would you describe OG's interactive style as she receives everything and gives out information to Kirsten and her as a person? Oh, why can't I watch it? Can y'all see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so y'all can see the video or no? Well, it's paused, the video is paused, I guess, but I can see that you're trying to show us something. Okay. So, let's just do... Okay, so let me go ahead and show you guys the video. Can y'all see YouTube? Or no? Yes, I can, I can see the YouTube screen. Okay. I share with OG that you have some things you want to get off your chest. No, not get off my chest. Okay. I wanted to come over here to have a comment. Sorry, y'all couldn't hear the video. Let me go back. Oh, can y'all hear? So, going back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so that was a clip from the hit show Basketball Wives, and basically what they were talking about was colorism, and I'm trying to pull my PowerPoint back up, but they were talking about colorism and just how it was very different to them when it comes to it. So I just hope that y'all kept in mind um, the questions that were asked. So from the clip you just saw, how would you describe Kristen and OG's interaction with each other? Um, from the outside looking in, how would you... Okay, there you go. From the outside looking in, how would you describe OG as a person? And how would you describe Kristen as a person? Anyone can answer, by the way. Yeah, y'all feel free to chime in. You don't need to um, wait your turn or anything. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and chime in there. Um, I'll get people started on this. Uh, so Kristen <laughs> looks like she is coming to OG. She's asking her questions. She wants to know something about OG's experience of her. So she's curious. She's wondering. Um, she has something that has not been answered uh, that she is um, thinking about and wants you know to investigate. And OG would be the source of that because it has to do with OG and some, and some experience she's having. Yes. So, um, oh. can I chime in? Yes, you can. Um, they both seem defensive in their own aspects because OG is very much trying to clarify, like, sh she hasn't shared her feelings. She's talking about something she has experienced. 
And Kristen doesn't want to be seen in the light of being colorist. And so they're both on the defensive, it seems. I really didn't think about it like that because I really thought that it would be OG being defensive. But now that you made it, that's kind of a good point. I like that. That's a good point. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, the meaning of intellectual empathy. This was also quoted by Professor Carrillo. So intellectual empathy is the deposition of intimately put oneself in the thinking place of others so as to genuinely understand another's reasoning in conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. The following in, in characteristics of someone who possesses this virtue recognize that human thinking emerges from the conditions of life from very different contexts and situations. They make a good faith effort to acquire accurate knowledge for another's thinking. They're willing to work through the set of assumptions other than his or her own, even when the view opposes one's own. Um, ability to recognize and admit why others may find a point view compelling and critics another's thinking only after he or she has made a genuine attempt to really understand it. Someone who consistently fails to reflect most of the personal qualities above may be accused in intellectual self-centered, self-centeredness, whereas intellectual empathy is a virtue, intellectual self-centeredness is a vice. So it's kind of the opposite. So here's my video analysis using the definition so the topic in the video clip is about colorism, obviously, and the different points of views and trying to understand it. In the video, Christian went into this conversation wanting to actually hear OG's side and feelings about what has transpired between the ladies. Um, Kristen is showing intellectual empathy by trying to understand OG's thoughts by her saying, I wanted to come over here to have a conversation with you, to hear you. Kristen reflected the virtue putting herself in the thinking place of others so that she genuinely understands OG's reasoning for feeling the way that she does. Um, Kristen then continues to say, I wanted to listen to how we got here when it comes down to people being colorist. And she apologizes for her feeling that way. Kristen was making a good effort in um, good faith and good effort to get the correct information from the source herself, which was OG and how she thinks and OG rejected the reflection in the video. Um, Jackie, who is the, this right here, Jackie, her, she um, voiced her opinion about the conversation saying that she witnessed, as to her witnessing it all, and she says that she feels nothing but good vibes from Kristen. She seems to have swallowed her pride. She's not confrontational. She's not Causatory, but oh, she has to be the one to receive Kristen. And I don't think that she's ready for this energy. By Jackie just saying that, she is letting us know that she feels like OG is rejecting Kristen's ability to recognize and admit why her and the other ladies may find OG's view compelling. By OG refusing or declining Kristen's efforts to accomplish her goal in trying to understand her, OG is being self-centered. Um, what led me to this presentation was actually, I was watching the episode that Shaw just viewed and after maybe the second episode or the other one after that, when OG actually explained her childhood trauma, I reached out to my professor and I just emailed her to see like, 
because I really didn't get this class. Honestly, this was like my hardest class. But just after watching that video and then comparing it to what we were learning, I kind of started getting it. And so I was just telling my teacher, you know, I just watched this video and I want to know, does that kind of, you know, is there a way that that has relations into anything that we're looking at? And she was like, yeah, it shows intellectual empathy. And, you know, it. I just think that you're really doing good with understanding that. So for me, understanding that OG let her childhood trauma grow with her into her adulthood and how she viewed everything different from everyone else and probably outsiders into the world, it really helped me understand more, not just about her and her life, but about the class that I was in. And it helped me understand a lot more than just from the textbooks that we were doing from the word. It's one thing to like read about it, you know, it's really one thing to read about it in the textbooks, but when you actually learn it because you compare it to what you see in everyday life or what others see in everyday life, it just opens up a whole new world. So it just made everything easier. It really made my course in, um, oh, it really made my course easier. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was, yeah, I really enjoyed the presentation and I completely agree with you. Being able to, to find these philosophical abstract ideas in concrete circumstances, you know, with, with real people sharing their individual perspectives like that, I think it does help make these philosophical points land in a way that resonates. So, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, if, and you, you, can, uh, you can get rid of the shared screen. Um, okay. And, yeah, so this brings us to our next presenter. Uh, our next presenter, I believe he's in the room, uh, Daniel Ha. He's presenting... Uh, Aristotle's Virtue Ethics, a real-world application. So yeah, we're sticking with this theme here temporarily of, um, uh, again, trying to locate ethics, or in the, in the previous case, epistemology, in this case, ethics, in concrete reality. So yeah, uh, Daniel, whenever you're ready, feel free to begin. Um, can you hear me? All right, okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to be reading my essay. Um, according to one textbook written by Louis Vaughn, Aristotle's philosophy consists not in following moral rules that stipulate right actions, but in striving to be a particular kind of person, a virtuous person, whose actions stem naturally from character. Um, this kind of ethics focuses on the big picture, and according to another textbook, published by Russ Schaefer Landau. A virtue is an admirable trait, not a mere habit or tendency to act in a certain way. On the flip side, vices are unwanted traits. They're the more negative ones. For Aristotle, there are two kinds of vices, extreme of deficiency as well as extreme of excess. In a video created by Dr. Susan Crillo, the idea that in terms of Aristotle, this is a delicate balance on a spectrum with vices on opposite sides and a virtue in the middle, a golden mean. Nurses around our nation have detailed their experiences in the summer of 2020, the extreme height of the COVID-19 pandemic. According to an article from the New York Times written by David Gonzalez and Sina Nassari, a senior staff nurse, Christine Jobro, said, it's a lot of wear and tear on my body on top of me working the night shift, taking care of these really sick patients. And I'm worn out because I have to keep going. I can't just give up on being a nurse. She gave an account of having to face a dilemma of comforting a dying patient and express, expressed her traumatic experiences and uncomfortable situations that she was put in due to the pandemic. A few other nurses in the article, Medina Rezeva and Gabrielle Barche, revealed the emotional toll that they experienced as a result. Rezeva experienced her fears of being absent due to her being a nurse while raising a two-year-old son from a distance. Barche, on the other hand, detailed how the stress of the surge in cases led to her losing compassion that she once had for her patients before the pandemic. Another article from the New York Times, created by Michael Schwartz, gave insight on the worries that came about 
During the worst of the pandemic, there were shortages in medical supplies and many practices that were required by hospitals, including reusing masks when not received properly. Nurse Kelly Cabrera said that it puts us in danger, it puts our patients in danger, and I can't believe the United States here is what's happening. Many of these healthcare workers described the brutal conditions that left them vulnerable and exposed, narrating a grim story where their personal safety was uncertain. Locally, nurses have been struggling too. According to an article written by the Dallas Morning Times, penned by Sharon Grigsby, the large hospitals in the DFW Metroplex, such as Parkland Hospital, nurses have vocally expressed their distress and their inefficient response to our nation and state that have had in relation to COVID-19. Many recount how their patients dying have put a burden on them, and they explained how the struggles of their patients affected them as well. The nurses said they were tired. Nurse Perella Sanchez Perez stated that this work takes a toll on you because it just keeps going. Overall, these nurses continued to struggle with working during the pandemic with many factors draining them. In this paragraph, I will focus on nurses in relation to Aristotle's virtue ethics. Some of these nurses exhibited a vice of an extreme of deficiency. In this case, that would be cowardice. The Cambridge Essential American English Dictionary defines cowardice as the behavior of someone who is not at all brave and tries to avoid danger. Additionally, the Macmillan Dictionary establishes cowardice as behavior that shows you are not brave enough to fight or do something difficult or dangerous that you should do. Imagine a nurse, we'll give him a name, Nurse Stan, is on the eighth hour of his 12-hour shift in the infectious ward at the hospital tending to patients with COVID-19. One of his patients is an old lady who's about to die from complications due to COVID-19. And she's alone as her family is not allowed to visit and every hour her health deteriorates. Nurse Stan passes by her bed knowing that she's about to die. He wants to take a short break to not have to deal with the death. She weakly croaks, Nurse, please stay with me. In response, Nurse Stan is stating, I am sorry, but it's too much for me. The patient ends up dying alone while Nurse Stan allows himself to sit for a few fleeting moments. I and the patient argue that he expressed cowardice because in this situation, he finds it overbearing and allows her to die alone. It would not be unreasonable to conclude that Nurse Dan shows cowardice because he does not exhibit bravery to help the dying patient. This is reinforced by the idea that he had found that it was too difficult to comfort her before she died. After all, he consciously chose to leave her even though she asked because it was easier for him to handle. In this paragraph, I will again focus on nurses in relation to Aristotle's virtue ethics. However, this time, some nurses exhibited a different vice on the opposite side, one of extreme of excess. And in this case, that would be foolhardiness. The American Heritage Dictionary defines it as unwisely bold or venturesome rash. Additionally, the Macmillan Dictionary establishes it as ignoring obvious dangers in a stupid way. In another hypothetical situation where Nurse Stan is again on the eighth hour, his 12th hour shift, he is an empathetic person this time. He takes additional time to comfort all of the dying patients and he stayed with too many lonely patients dying all day. One more of the dying patients asked him to stay, and he agrees. And he sits at the bedside holding their hand, knowing that this may be potentially foolish due to the excess exposure. After a long day of helping highly affected patients, he goes home to his wife and children. For all the sick around him, he unknowingly transmits the virus to his family. I and Nurse Stan's family could argue that he expressed foolhardiness because in this situation, he put himself in unnecessary situations where he could potentially transmit the virus. I could reasonably conclude that Nurse Stan shows this because he chose to make a decision that was unwise and bold. By being excessively close to the contagious virus to support the dying, he ignores the potential consequences. And in this case, it's a dangerous one. After all, he is a healthcare worker who willingly chose to stay close to the patients even with the harm that could have aroused his family. In this last paragraph, I will focus on nurses However, this time it will be the nurses that exhibit the balance of the golden mean, a virtue, in this case would be courage. The Cambridge Essential American English Dictionary defines courage as the quality that makes you able to do dangerous or difficult things. And additionally, the Macmillan Dictionary establishes it as the ability to do something that you know is right or good, even though it is dangerous, frightening, or very difficult. Picture a different scenario for Nurse Stan. In this situation, he's working long shifts at the hospital and exerting more energy than he has ever had to do before in his career to help as many people as possible. He has treated more than 30 patients today in different areas. Nurse Stan is flexible and allows himself to be useful so that he's able to treat as many people that need him. 
One of these is a dying old woman. Per hospital policy, the family is not allowed to visit as she dies. However, he is able to be there. Nurse Karen knows this, so he stays in the room at a distance and comforts her in her last moments. He sometimes is overwhelmed. Patient's death places an emotional burden on him. This is just one of several patients he has had to do this for today. He needs to put on a steadfast facade for her to allow her some peace before she dies. After his shift, he leaves to go home to his family. However, knowing that he's been in contact with the patients that are sick, he isolates himself with the possibility of transmitting the virus. I and those he has interacted with today can argue that he is courageous because in this instance, he chooses to put the patient's need above his own fear. Nurse Stan chooses to do what is right. He wills himself to do something that is difficult for him emotionally, hence he's being courageous. By going out of his way to support the dying patients despite the effects on him, he exhibits courage. The delicate balance of courage founded in the situation deploy displays Aristotle's virtue ethics precisely in striving to be a particular kind of person, a virtuous person whose actions stem naturally from character. Um, that's it. All right, well, thank you so much for that, Daniel. Yeah, again, um, following up on the previous presentation as well, just it's nice seeing these, again, abstract terms sort of uh, contextualized in, you know, in this case, uh, a person's profession. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any questions for Daniel or any, any comments or feedback? Okay, well, I mean, I, I have a question, frankly. Um, now, I, again, you, you did bring up uh, vices, of course, which, um, you know, go against the virtues. Of, and Aristotle is, you know, very, very clear. He's saying, look, it's very difficult to achieve these virtues, um, even one of these virtues and maintain it over the course of time. Um, and, but nonetheless, I think you've, you've given up a, a really excellent analysis of how, again, one can cultivate the virtues such as courage in that particular context of being a nurse. But um, what are some of the difficulties, do you think, in terms, well, let me, let me phrase it this way. Could the same person's, um, I suppose, lifestyle, the opportunities uh, that that person's life presents her with, can she um, develop vices in the same context, do you think? Um, like, do you think it's possible for her to uh, maybe erode her character with the same decisions if she were to maybe choose otherwise? with the same, I suppose, options for decisions? I think that um, this is a really complex situation with um, different factors that um, intertwine. And so um, it really depends because um, you can view it from that point or you can view it as the, um, it really doesn't. Um, you know, because in this situation, um, this is like a once in a lifetime, once in a generation event that's happened and it's been so surprising. And um, you could always view it as her character or you could view it as um, the situation. Like it doesn't match her character, it's, it's something new. Yeah, okay, great. I appreciate that response. Yusha, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question for, for Daniel. Um, when it comes to vices, do you think that it could be it could be shared, like passed down from one generation to another? And as like Orlando and I often get into the discussion that they can or cannot be, for example, if a father drinks a lot, right? And the, the sons or the son starts drinking as well at, a, at an early age and then they carry on drinking, so on and so forth. So do you think, in your opinion, after writing the essay and doing the research, uh, is it is it truly possible? What's your opinion on that? Um, I think that sometimes it is more of the outside factors that play into it. If you are a child and you're like around someone, I, I, I do believe that you could pass it down. It's being in an environment that is um, negative and harmful. You can pick up those traits and I'll and when it comes down, um, yeah, it passes down. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Nancy, you're on mute. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, is the next presentation, a, uh, it's, it's right up next, um, but I do wanna hear from John 
He always has good questions. All right, John, what's your question? I'll save it. Great, thanks, John. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, like I said, very, very intriguing presentation, especially, again, when you can bring those concepts down into reality. Uh, the next presenter is Courtney Breesley. So Courtney will be presenting on a topic, namely free will. Title of her presentation is, Are We Free? An Analysis of the Idea of Free Will and Determinism. Also, yes, I see Courtney's all set. Uh, yeah, feel free to take it away, Courtney. Okay, so my name is Courtney Breesley, and I am going to do an analysis of free will in relation to determinism. So there was an article by Gary Gutting. He wrote an article called, What Makes Free Will Free? And in the article, he discusses a, um, scientific, a scientific experiment that predicts someone's choice with up to 80% accuracy. This raises the question of, is a choice that is caused free? And one of the biggest philosophical answers or attempts to answer the question is determinism. Now, determinism is the idea that we are subject to the deterministic laws of nature and have no free will. And there are two kind of takes on determinism. One would be hard determinism. And that is the branch of determinism that our use free will is non-existent. We are not free. We are all simply doing what we need to do to survive. So me going to college is not a free choice. That is a result of me needing to survive. It is a means to an end. I go to college so I can get a job. I get a job so I can get money. I get money so I can eat. I eat so I can survive. It is not a free choice. It is caused by my circumstances around me and my need for survival. Now, soft determinism, on the other hand, or compatibilism, is the idea that while our choices are determined, we do have a degree of control. We are free to an extent. So a soft determinist would argue that while I am going to college, I could have chosen a career that doesn't require me to go to college, or I could have chosen a different major, or I could choose to go to a certain college versus this college. And that is basically the idea of the level of control I have over the situation. While I do need to work so I can make money so I can survive, I have the choice in which work I do. And of course, hard determinist, a hard determinist would rebuttal that by saying that my disposition and my temperament and my environment have determined which career choice I'm making and thus it's not free. A hard determinist and a soft determinist could go back and forth all day determining whether or not a choice is essentially free. Um, next slide, next slide, please. So one of the biggest hard determinists is Baron Paul de Holbach. And de Holbach essentially says, um, quote, actions of man are never free. They are always the necessary consequence of his temperament, of the received ideas, and of the notions, either true or false, which he has formed to himself of happiness." End quote. So de Holbach puts us on the same level as pretty much any other animal. A chicken scratches at the ground to get a worm. The chicken gets the worm to eat. The chicken eats to survive. So here de Holbach basically says that every choice we make is in order to ensure our own survival and our own happiness because we want to survive and we want to survive well we don't want to survive misery we want to survive thrive and procreate so every choice we make is in order to ensure that de holbach in fact goes so far as to claim that the practice of virtue is just the um basically restriction of one's own happiness. So the problem with the whole box argument, however, is that it doesn't allow for moral accountability. 
someone murdered another person because he saw him commit a crime and he committed that crime because he needed money and he needed money to buy food so he could eat so he could survive is he still responsible for that murder the thing is is saying that no choice is free doesn't allow for any moral responsibility and in a society that requires us to hold responsibility for our actions that doesn't exactly work the Holbach argues that essentially good and evil are purely subjective based on religion or government and thus moral accountability is only plausible within the system a man condemns himself to so as someone who is part of a society, I am thus subject to the society's virtues that are placed on me. And that's the only sense of moral responsibility I have. Next slide, please. John Stuart Mill, on the other hand, is a soft determinist or a compatibilist, if you will. And Mill essentially claims that freedom and determinism are compatible by defining freedom as nothing other than acting in accordance with one's own character, desires, and wishes. So John Stuart Mill says that yes, all of our choices are determined by outside and external factors, but that doesn't make them not free. If I'm choosing to go to college so I can get a job, so I can pay for things I need to survive, I'm still acting with what I want to do. I want to go to college, therefore I'm going to college, therefore I made the choice to go to college because I'm acting in accordance with my own desire, my own wishes. John Stuart Mill says that basically just because you're doing it for survival doesn't make it necessarily unfree. Now, the thing about this is that all depends on how you define freedom. Next slide, please. The responsibility associated with freedom is also a big issue that arises with both compatibilism and hard determinism. Because with hard determinism, if we are truly not free, should we be held responsible for our actions? Because if we're not free and nothing we do is made of free will, then how can we ever blame anyone for anything they do? However, on the other hand, if we have compatibilism, we still have the issue of how much responsibility should we hold. Because arguably, someone who has a gun to their head is less free than someone who does not. If we have two mothers who both need to feed their children, and one of them only has $5 and the other one has $20, they both need to buy $10 worth of food, but they both choose to steal from the grocery store to feed their children. Is the one who physically couldn't buy the food more responsible? than the one who could buy the food but just didn't have extra money. And the thing about that is the ability to do otherwise is a big argument for freedom. People argue we are free if we have the ability to do otherwise, but how far can you stretch the ability to do otherwise? Where is that line at for our own responsibility? Next slide, please. All of this really boils down to the question of what is freedom? In order to understand if we are free, we must define what it means to be free. If we go back to Gary Gutting's article where he discusses the experiment by John Dylan Haynes, we have basically this experiment and it predicts with up to 80% accuracy what choice we're gonna make before we even make it. Let's say science advances, technology advances, and we are able to present, predict with 100% accuracy the choice someone will make before they even make it. Does that make the choice inherently not free? If you tell me to choose between sandwiches or soup, I'm going to choose sandwiches because frankly, I don't like soup. Does that make my choice not free? I could have chosen to eat soup even though I don't like it. And that all just boils down to where exactly we draw the line of a free choice and how exactly we define what it means to be free. Because some arguably say that freedom is the ability to do otherwise, while others say that freedom is the ability to be free of influence. But the thing is, is 
we will always be influenced. The freest choice we can make is to just simply die. And that that is all I have. <coughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. I um, I have to say, very very lucid. I thought you really broke down the different versions there uh, of freedom and determinism and their quote unquote challenges really, really clearly. Um, I mean, I have, I have a couple of questions, but uh, of course, I'll open it up to um, the attendance here at the conference. Does anybody have any questions or comments on what Courtney presented? Okay, well, um, let, let me ask you this, because again, I feel as though you have such a strong grasp of, of the various uh, determinisms. Um, what, what do you find to be the most compelling? I guess I'll ask you that. I'm Is sorry, your audio cut out. Sorry, that's one of the guest speakers calling me because he can't get into the <laughs> uh, So let me ask you this. What, um, what, if any, brand of determinism do you feel is the most compelling? Do you feel like might be the most persuasive? If any, again. Personally, I lean more towards soft determinism. And the reason being for that is I feel like it's more compelling within our society because in our society, we can't necessarily avoid responsibility for actions. <laughs> the, the thing about hard determinism is responsibility only exists within the community that you group yourself into, if you can even separate yourself from a community. And if someone goes against the community or goes against the religion or goes against the government or whatever group that they are in, how do we define the responsibility that they hold morally, the moral obligations that they have? So personally, I feel like soft, determin soft determinism is more compelling because not only does it hold us more morally accountable, but also one of the things about determinism is it ignores the fact that we are different from any other animal in the fact that we can resist our urges. Animals, when they get hungry, they eat. But as humans, we can resist our urges, our hunger cues. Um, people who are part of certain religious groups will go on fasts. People who are trying to make a point will not eat or even things like eating disorders. We can ignore our basic biology in order for, in order to make a point, in order to argue for injustice or simply because we choose to. We do have the ability to basically go against our own nature. So I feel like soft determinism is more compelling because it does allow for us to have that choice. Yeah, that was just a, a marvelous response. Um, I really like how you thought it through there, especially with this idea of, yeah, kind of both working with, but also kind of working against our nature. And maybe it's in our nature to do precisely that, to have that kind of dialectical relationship to um, what might be considered constraints, but in other ways might be considered, again, springboards for, I suppose, the flourishing of our own choices, our own desires, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, thank you for that. Great response. Um, Okay, I guess it's time for our, our next presenter here. Uh, well, a couple of presenters, I should say. Um, so we have Ava Athena Mason and Osita Walter Ogjiofor. And uh, again, they are, they are you know, constant, um, constant members of the Philosophy Club. Uh, they speak up a lot, so I'm excited about this presentation. They are combining their efforts on a presentation called The Good Place, a greater take on the lesser of two evils, a modern solution to the modern political problem. Very intriguing title. So yeah, I believe uh, Ava and Osita are in the room. Um, feel free to begin your presentation whenever you're ready. We're working we're on the screen sharing at that time. I'm sorry, what was that? You guys are working on it? Yeah, we're doing... Um... We're working on the screen sharing. I guess what's the best way to like share a PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, so just uh, if one of y'all bring brings it up like on your screen, and uh -huh. then you hit the share screen, and then um, okay. yeah, that might be a good one to do it. All right, then we'll do that. Oh. 
So can you see our PowerPoint? No. 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 Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, window? Ah, okay. Yeah, and if you're having trouble, you can all, oh, there it is, never mind. Perfect, now we got it. Look into this. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, hope everyone can hear us and see the PowerPoint. Yeah, so the good place, a great a greater take on the lesser of two evils a modern solution to the modern political problem so um i we're going to start with a clip from the show the good place i assume everyone here um uh uh everyone here fans of philosophy and everything um has probably seen the show if not well i'm not sure what you're doing <laughs> with life um so let's play this first clip just so we can get um because our inspiration for this uh, project sort of came from the good places take on the answer to the trolley problem. So I guess for anyone who doesn't know, we'll, we'll just do a quick overview of the trolley problem. Can you hear it? No, it's very, um, you know what it is? You have to share audio too when you share the screen. So you may not have shared audio. Turn this one off. Yeah, I'll turn it right down. Oh, oh. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay so can you see the powerpoint now yeah okay let's see if the audio works feel like you're engaging with the material like with the trolley problem that was just tricky that's all why don't you just tell me the right answer well that's what's so great about the trolley problem is that there is no right answer answer. Uh, this is why everyone hates moral philosophy professors. I'm on your side here, dude, but he is not wrong. Okay, Michael. <laughs> when it comes to human ethics, I just know more than you. Okay. I've been studying it my whole life. It's just that it's so theoretical, you know? I mean, you know, maybe there's a more concrete approach. Here, let, let's try this. Oh, God! Michael, what did you do? I made the trolley problem real so we could see how the ethics would actually play out. There are five workers on this track and one over there. Here are the levers to switch the tracks. Make a choice. The thing is, I mean, ethically speaking, you're trying to make a decision. Well, it's tricky. I mean, on the one hand, if you ascribe to a purely utilitarian world you... Okay. So. What did we learn? Jenny? Talk it out, Jenny. What do we think? He thinks he just killed a bunch of people with a trolley. It's just a simulation. I would never make you kill real people. Oh, well, that's reassuring. Because some of the parts of the fake people flew into my mouth! Michael, can we just go back to the classroom? We never left. Here, I'll show you. All uh, yeah. Look, see, buddy, none of this was real. Well, they're fake people, but their pain is real. Does that make sense? There have to be stakes, or it's just another thought experiment. This is awful. You specifically asked me if there was a way I could connect with the material more. I'm trying, you guys. Sorry. You're right. I want to help you understand this. Thank you, Chief. So, let's try again. Oh, I, I, I thought maybe we would have a discussion. No, the whole point is to play out the scenario in real time. Wait, Judy, watch it! Okay. 
Okay, okay, I can do this. I am choosing to switch the shots, so that way I only kill one person. Oh, forgot to tell you, this is the scenario where you actually know one of the people. It's your friend Henry there. Cheaty! How are you, mate? Henry the Boo! Oh, nice trolley. I can't cheat. My boots are stuck in the trash. Henry Boo! Anyway, long time no this. Again, just a simulation, an almost impossibly lifelike simulation. Would someone's foot really fly off their body like that? That was kind of cool. Uh, right, that was kind of cool. So, um, yeah, so that's the, uh, I hope everyone can still hear me. I hope, so that was the trolley problem. Um, one of those impossible philosophical uh, conundrums, but the good place. Um, oh, uh, and we have Philippa Foote here because she is credited with sort of uh, coining the trolley problem. Um, but The Good Place um, has... Uh, oh, sorry? Hey, I see that. I th uh, we're still on the first slide. Um, feel like you're engaging. <laughs> mm. Did you guys? <laughs> did you guys not see any of that? Or is it? Uh, it went back to the first slide. Went back to the first slide. I don't know. Can you see the second slide now? No. No. Try no, slide one. You're engaging with the material. Like oh god, it's my worst nightmare. Um, so is it is is it just not moving it's at just all? Just staying on the first slide. That's so weird. Hey, guess what? What if I like just skip the video sequences? Is it? Um, still the first slide. Try exiting the presentation mode and then go to the slide that you're referring All right, to. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Nothing. That didn't. Um, let me oh see. Hey, sorry about that. I can't drop. Um, oh, okay. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah, now we're good. Okay. Uh, well, you guys heard it, right? <laughs> the first, the first video. Yeah, we we saw most of it. So okay, well we'll just so yeah. Anyway, that's the trolley problem. So we'll go on to the good places, their solution to it, and our inspiration for for the problem that we'll be tackling in this talk. Um, okay, let's see if this works. Hey, guess what? I just solved the trolley problem. Remember the thought experiment where you're driving the trolley and you can either plow into a group of people or turn and hit one person? I solved it. It's really great, but I don't think now's the time. See, the trolley problem forces you to choose between two versions of letting other people die. And the actual solution is very simple. You sacrifice yourself. What does that mean? You look after the others. They need you. No. Step away from the portal! Goodbye. No, no way! Wait. Hey, boss. What's up? Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if... I don't know if you guys could actually see it, but if y'all heard the response that Michael gave to the trolley problem was that rather than uh, letting others die, we can sacrifice ourselves um, or sacrifice himself in this case. Right. Just to not let others die. In this case, in this right? Case. And so. So we wanted to like kind of widen that because we are huge like political nerds and philosophy nerds and there's a huge uh, Venn diagram where they highly overlap. And so this was something that kind of made us think of a solution to another problem right? is in all of our lives, especially in the United States right now. Right. And I suppose if we take, if we relate that to the trolley problem, maybe Michael is suggesting, well, then you just should throw yourself onto the track. So neither of the groups of people die, but luckily we're not asking you to throw yourself in front of a runaway trolley today. Um, so the problem that we are, um, and again, let us know if you know the slides aren't changing. I just changed slides, or if you can't hear us or anything. Um, so the problem that we are uh, wanting to tackle today is is um, 
the current uh, the current political divide in America and how that might be uh, perpetuated by the two party system, how the two party system might be contributing to the <sighs> declining. What would you say? Declining um, lack of representation, like between the actual people's views and the actions of the current government up with regards to both political parties. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's actually a great way to put it. So here's a, oops. Um, so these are studies. Uh, I, I think these are based off major Princeton studies that says the US is an oligarchy now. We have, we have transitioned into an oligarchy, um, which is ruled by, uh, which is an oligarchy is ruled by a small number of, of powerful, rich elites rather than um, the majority of the people, um, a representative majority of the people. Um, and the way that they uh, did this study was looking at 2000 policy changes between 1981 and 2002 and compared that to the preferences of average Americans, um, wealthy citizens and interests in lobbying groups. Um, and they found this, that the people that were controlling it was like you said, the, the elites, these wealthy citizens of both Republican and Democratic parties, interest groups that don't necessarily align with the majority of Americans. Right. Um, and actually, we wanted to read a small excerpt okay. from that yeah. study. Um, I'll read the first one. When a majority of citizens disagrees with an economic with with economic elites and or with organized interests, they generally lose. Moreover, because of the strong status quo bias built into the U.S. political system, even when fairly large majorities of Americans favor policy change, they generally do not get it. And then they, their study uh, conclusion is that Americans do enjoy many features central to democratic governance, such as regular elections, freedom of speech and association, and a widespread, if still contested, franchise. But we believe that if policymaking is dominated by powerful business organizations and a small number of affluent Americans, then America's claim as a democratic society are seriously threatened. Right. So we're going based off the argument that, yes, the will of the people is not represented, even though um, both major political parties have exchanged power uh, multiple times since 1980. Um, and so we're going to more or less barrage you with a bunch of uh, uh, news stories that sort of illustrate the point that we're trying to make that um, regular everyday Americans, no matter, and we're not, we're not, we're not trying to make any um, political statement here. We're just trying to advocate for uh, representation for all Americans that would, that would produce the most good over Overall, not necessarily in a utilitarian way, but uh, so we see here that there is there ha there is a is um, a desire for a major a new major political party in the United States. Um, if you see these these headlines, most Americans desperate for you know a major political party in Trump era. Sixty three percent of Republicans say third major party political party is needed. Uh, support for third U.S. political party high. Um, majority majority in U.S. still say a third party is needed. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there's talk of the Patriot Party. There's talk of the People's Party. Um, there's a Green Party and the Libertarian Party. So there is a desire for another major political party because there are some Americans who do feel like their their voices aren't being heard. Oh, we're running late, so we should hurry. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. We'll go really fast. Um, so yeah, just uh, more of the lesser of two evil. Every four years, it's always that, and um, you know that's just what people think. That's what the majority of people think that we just have to choose the lesser of two evils, which is how this relates to the trolley problem. Exactly. Um, they're both two evil choices. Either way, you are making a conscious decision to kill somebody. Um, so, I mean, I know may, not necessarily with elections, but that could also be argued with, we don't really take argued. into consideration the vast consequences of our voter choice. So if you say it's a lesser of two evils, you're still admitting that you're voting for evil and exactly. you're continuing this evil system. Exactly. Um, so yeah, we're just going to go through like really quick. I don't know. I'm sorry. Oh, what happened? Oops. 
Oh uh, yeah, just go through that. It's uh, within the the both the parties. There's examples of these things within right. the elites during the pandemic. Their wealth has grown while the you know most uh, marginalized people in the United States have their plight has gotten worse. Exactly. We see here at the Washington Post, income inequality in America is the highest it's been since the Census Bureau started tracking it. So it's only gotten worse regardless of which political party uh, is in power. Billionaires keep getting richer. Um, and, the, and, and especially during the pandemic, it almost seems like public policy was influenced by the richest to gain trillions and trillions of dollars when so many Americans uh, were, were going through the worst economic crisis of their lifetime. Um, here is, you know, and again, we're not picking on any particular political party. This is Obama. Uh, this is just within the, the same he, he, year, within, yeah. within the, the same year, he was elected to end the war in Afghanistan, but Hey, you know, that military industrial complex, um, gets a say also. So we have here, Obama's promises to year end close to Afghanistan war. Boom. A couple months later, in reversal, Obama says U.S. soldiers stay in Afghanistan. Trump said he'd take the troops out. Now Biden's saying he ta he'll take the troops out. We'll see. And the day just keeps getting delayed. So, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Um, Same thing with stocks and the yeah. insider trading that is just totally allowed, if right. not even encouraged by the way our all of our you know tax system campaign finance systems are set up so it's an example on the left of purdue a republican and on the right pelosi a democrat same thing with donald trump he got the c x c exxon mobil ceo for secretary of state while we got a Raytheon raytheon board member from biden for the secretary, for the of, defense. secretary of defense that shows the 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 fascistic um uh, tendencies that are are now uh, just blatant, I think, in the U.S. Uh, government. Um, and these are just more congressmen. You know, these both of these Swalwell on the left, Gates on the right, both uh, uh, committing salacious uh, 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 acts. Um, but we we would assume that neither will be punished by either by anyone by either by either censure or or or. or Especially if we just do the lesser of two evils, they'll be continue to be voted for. We'll keep giving them money, and right. Right, because there's the, no accountability. They are the lesser of two evils in their in their voters' eyes. So we're going pretty fast, and this is the last this last bit of of making our point of this lesser of two evils. They're both evil. Um, this this again, fascistic corporate uh, public merit to um, uh, marginalized regular Americans. These these large um, corporations who took PPP money before any small businesses had the chance to, some of them gave their money back, but I, I, I'm confident that a large number were able to um, fly under the radar and were able to keep PPP money that should have gone to regular everyday Americans and small businesses. And we see uh, on the right here, dark money in U.S. elections is off the charts and it's only growing uh, it's only growing year by year, and it seems impossible that regular Americans can keep up with the large number of, uh, of donations that are flowing in from the private sector. Um, so now to the philosophy of it. Right. Um, so Philip Afoot was a virtue ethicist and a neo Aristotelist uh, from from the revival of virtue ethics, and um, coming back to the uh, to the trolley problem, Philip argued that um, this. Uh, initiating of the causal sequence that you know results in someone dying is just not morally permissible, and that um, if you do have this notion of choosing the lesser of two evils, then you are knowingly um, advocating for the negative. Um, so we say that by voting for one of the major political parties, when there is a candidate that more closely fits your moral and logical stances, you're perpetuating the duopoly and knowingly perpetuating a system that strengthens the group of rapacious oligarchy in the system. So, um, right. And, oh, whoops, we meant to edit this slide, but, um, whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're going to a utilitarian take, um, next, um, and utilitarians believe to maximize overall good, minimize overall suffering. Um, and I, and I, I say, ironically, I think that this is the philosophy that most people use who vote, uh, while having any sort of uh, significant reservation about the candidate that they're voting for, they think, well, I am just trying to maximize overall good, lesser of two evils. But we argue that 
uh, perhaps the actual way to maximize overall good is advocating for and voting for a new major political party that just that is nonpartisan and that advocates for regular everyday Americans. Um, and Absolutely no corporate money or corporate interest, just at everyday, everyday Americans. That's the end of that. Right. Yeah. Um, and we make this argument by arguing that both political parties propel this country deeper into oligarchy and fascism. Can y'all hear that? I can. I assumed it was on your end, no? It? It's uh, Professor Carrillo's mic. Um, yeah, we got to. Oh, okay, that, that was terrifying. Um, uh, yeah, you go. You uh, go so uh, another uh, philosophical take that advocates for this, we we asked what Kant would do in this situation, and he had a, the universal maxim of never tell a lie. And so based on this um, categorical imperative of uh, never kill, we can assume that he would believe in that as well. So in the trolley problem, we say that pulling the lever, choosing the lesser two evils and killing one person, you violate the autonomy of that individual because you're using them as a pure means to make yourself feel vir virtuous. Um, another way to look at it, would you wanna be the person struck by the plane, uh, by, by the train, or would you um, wanna be the healthy person that was killed by the surgeon in order to have your, your organs, argue, your organs harvested for five people. Um, if it's morally permissible, you yourself would sacrifice yourself to do it. So our proposed universal maxim is always vote your conscience, no matter uh, who is on the ballot. Um, right, and so possible rebuttal to our argument would be contractualism. And I believe that Hobbes uh, suggests that so long as others are, uh, uh, everyone has to be obeying the contract, right, for, for you to be bound by it. If no one else votes for an alternative political party, why should I be uh, obligated to vote for an alternative political party? Um, and, and that's a fair contract because, or as, that's a fair argument um, if, if you take Hobbes' uh, definition that you're only bound if everyone is, is abiding by the contract. But, you know, going based off his own contractual theory, we argue that both political, major political parties um, have broken their contract with their voters and their electorate, um, and, and they have no right to obligation, to any obligation or support. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, and- All right, well- Yeah, I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta cut it, folks, I'm sorry. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're sorry. We're so sorry. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, like, go to- I, I really appreciate the connections you're making there. And um, again, those are not obvious connections to make between, you know, the trolley problem and, and then the political, uh, well, all the details you provided us with. Again, I, steeped in information and um, yeah, very nuanced, uh, I, I would say overall arguments here for um, what you're getting at. So thank you. I really, really appreciate that presentation. I wish I didn't have to cut you off. Yeah, I'm no. really sorry about all the problems. Yeah, tech, you know, that's technical problems. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, we appreciate your time. Yeah, likewise. All right, so again, our next presenter is a guest speaker, um, Dr. Timothy A. Burns. Uh, he is a professor at the University of St. Thomas up in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's presenting something called Husserl's Ideas Too, Introduction to a Philosophical Mystery. Um, fantastic, we saw a little bit of Husserl earlier today. Um, and then of course we had a presentation on Camus. So kind of returning back to that general area of thoughts. Uh, yeah, take it away, Tim. And feel free to go a little bit over if you need to, no worries. Cool, thank you, Jeff. And uh, I might need some, uh, I, I have a, a slideshow here, uh, but I don't have any idea how to present on Teams. We use Zoom, so I'm at a technological disadvantage. Yeah, so um, you should be able to, uh, to click on the option that says share screen. If you click on the um, ellipses at the bottom. Bottom or the top, more actions. Uh, it should be, are you on a Windows or a Mac? I'm on Windows. Uh, try your top right hand corner. It's like a rectangular box with an arrow pointing upwards. There we go, share content. Thank and you. if you have any audio, make sure to select the box where it says share with audio. Will do, thank you so much, I appreciate it. You're welcome that Jeff is a class act it is just like him to have a uh, 
a, a tech person on site, on the call, ready to go. Here we go. All right, so you should be seeing the first page. It's got a, pic a picture of a couple of boring books and uh, a couple of long dead philosophers. Uh, can you see that? Uh, yes, you're good. Yep. All right, cool. So what I'm going to uh, present today is I've tried to frame it in terms of something like a uh, uh, a mystery um, or a, a crime because it, maybe it is a crime. Uh, but basically, I want to give you an insight into uh, the historical background of some of the research that I'm working on at the moment um, and uh, some of the sort of intrigue that's going on that motivates my interest. So it's really less into my research per se and more into the historical background. So um, first, I want to introduce the main characters of our drama. Um, Edmund Husserl, which you can see on the left here, uh, is one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. He was uh, Moravian by birth, uh, nestled in there between uh, Poland and Germany and Switzerland and uh, what would become the Czech Republic, uh, this little area of Moravia. Uh, he's a philosopher and mathematician, um, particular to the what we're considering right now. Um, in 1900 and 1901, Edmund Husserl hits the big time with the publication of a book called The Logical Investigations. Um, and at that time, he was offered a professorship at the University of uh, Göttingen, and he would stay there until about 1915 uh, or 16. Second person, so you've probably heard of Edmund Husserl. You may or may not have heard of a philosopher named Edith Stein. Edith Stein is pictured here in the middle. Um, she was uh, Polish by birth or Salesian by birth, would be more precise. Uh, she was born into a Jewish family. Um, she read psychology, philosophy, and Germanic literature at university. If you ever want to sound really pretentious to your friends, tell them that you're reading at university because you don't study at university, you read. Anyway. Um, she was a student of Husserl. She went to uh, Göttingen to study with him and she wrote her dissertation on the problem of empathy and she would come to work for him later. So um, the mystery, I realize I haven't told you what is the mystery. The mystery is the question, who wrote this book? Uh, the book that you see here is Ideas Pertaining to a Pure Phenomenology and to a Phenomenological Philosophy, the second book. Um, and I am going to argue and show you some historical reasons to believe that the authorship of this book was not so, uh, it's, not a, it's not a clear cut question. Okay. We know our main characters. Let's talk a little bit about the historical timeline. Um, like I said, 1901, Husserl publishes um, the second of the two volumes of the logical investigation. He's a, it's an automatic sensation. He's a huge hit. He's offered this position at the University of Göttingen. Um, and in 1902, uh, a guy named Johannes Dauber rode his bicycle from Munich to Göttingen uh, to meet with Husserl because he was fascinated by this new work. And Johannes Dauber was a uh, student at uh, the University of Munich, at Ludwig's Maximilian, I can't pronounce it, LMU, Ludwig's Maximilian Universität in Munich. Um, and that was a big place for the, where the study of psychology uh, was uh, sort of emerging. We have figures like uh, Carl Stumpf, uh, who held the chair in philosophy and psychology there. So in 1902, he rides from Munich uh, to Göttingen on a bicycle, meets with Husserl, gets excited, and then he decides that he's leaving Munich and he's going to go study in Göttingen. And this begins the Munich invasion of Göttingen. Basically, there was a brain drain on the University of Munich. They lost their some of their brightest uh, philosophers, Roman Ingarden, Otto Freinach, um, Johannes Dauber, uh, and uh, Conrad Martius and others. Uh, between 1903 and 1907, all flocked from uh, Munich to Göttingen to work with Husserl. 
1913, two things that are particularly important to our story happen. Um, Edith Stein, who had been studying in um, Breslau at the University of Breslau, decides that she is going to move to Göttingen to study with Husserl as well. She's fascinated by this idea of phenomenology that he uh, promotes in the logical investigations. Um, she does this without, <laughs> it's kind of absurd the way that she does it, if you think about it. Um, she doesn't write ahead to say that she's coming. She doesn't like apply or seek admission. She knows somebody who lives in Göttingen and she says, you know what, I'm going to this town and I'm going to study with this guy. And so she just decides that she's going to go there. Um, and in the same year, Husserl publishes Ideas One. Ideas One is Husserl's first big publication after logical investigations. And it is in Ideas One that Husserl really lays out for the first time uh, his uh, exactly what his phenomenology is. And very importantly, um, he promises a secret, right? Um, his ideas pertaining to a pure phenomenology and a phenomenological philosophy uh, was always a first book. Uh, it was supposed to present a sequel. It was supposed to be an introduction to uh, phenomenology, whereas the second and third book were supposed to consider uh, phenomenologies of nature and spirit and uh, of the human person. So this gets published. Edith Stein moves to Göttingen. She makes her way into the Göttingen circle. Um, Husserl accepts her as a student. Um, she begins to attend his lectures. And then all of a sudden, World War I breaks out. Right. So after just over a year of being in uh, Göttingen with Husserl, Stein returns to uh, she has to return home to Breslau. Um, in her spare time, she is working on her dissertation, which will become on the problem of empathy. Um, but in the meantime, she is, the first thing that she does is she works uh, for the Red Cross in a hospital for uh, soldiers with, uh, that have contagious disease, uh, that have typhoid. So she worked in a typhoid war, uh, war during World War I. Um, and then it is closed and she is sent home. She then is a, uh, she's a fill-in uh, Latin and Greek uh, teacher at her old high school um, during the day. And at night she is working on her dissertation. Um, as World War I winds to an end, Edmund Husserl in 1916 gets, uh, Pretty big promotion. He gets uh, offered a chair of philosophy, which comes with uh, more prestige, more money, um, and more notoriety. And he moves to the University of Freiburg. Now, Stein had not yet completed her dissertation. So Stein, as a student, moves with Husserl to Freiburg. And um, in 1916, presents and defends her uh, dissertation and then publishes it in 1917. Um, hers is the first uh, philosophy PhD that Husserl, uh, that is granted at Freiburg under Husserl's direction, right? So she's his first PhD student there, his first doctorate. Um, Husserl then asks Stein to be his research assistant and she agrees. And we know from the letters that we have between her and Wilman Ingarden um, and from other, from her biographical sources, her autobiographical sources, that she was uh, elated at this opportunity to collaborate with their Meister, the master, as she called Husserl. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of like fast forward. We see here at the end of the timeline, 1952, Ideas 2 is eventually published, right? Um, I wanna go in a little closer look into what happens in 1917 and 1919. So as I've told you, Husserl hired Stein to work as his research assistant. Um, Stein is given the impression that her primary responsibility is to prepare the text of Ideas 2 and 3, the sequel volumes to Ideas 1, which remember came out in 1913, right? Um, Husserl is going, he, he's making important publications in the years 
but if you notice here, there's big gaps between Husserl's big publications, right? 1900 and 1901 are uh, his logical investigations and doesn't, his next really big publication is 1913. Um, Stein doesn't want there to be another 13 year lapse between the publication of the, the sequel that he has promised. Right? So her primary uh, responsibility is the preparation of the manuscript of ideas two and three. Incidentally, Stein also prepares um, some lectures that have become very famous on the phenomenology of the consciousness and in internal time. And I just wanna take a second here and talk about some sexism in the history of philosophy, if I can. So if you look on the right here, you see a cover uh, for a German edition of the book. Stein prepared these lectures on the phenomenology of the consciousness of internal time um, for publication while she was working with Husserl. And um, Husserl like, was like, oh yeah, that's great, but he never like gave the go ahead to go and publish them. And so they just got put on the back burner. And so after Stein finishes that, she goes to working on ideas two and three. But in 1922, um, the man who took over for uh, as research assistant when Stein will leave in 1919, 1918, um, towards the end of the year, I can't remember exactly when it happens. Uh, the man, you may have heard of him, his name is Martin Heidegger. Uh, becomes the research assistant for uh, Edmund Husserl. In 1922, he convinces Husserl to go ahead and publish the phenomenology of the, uh, the lectures on the, the time consciousness lecture, right? Um, and if you can look at the bottom there, you can see Martin Heidegger, editor. Um, he takes credit for being the editor of these. Uh, now, it turns out that that's just false. Heidegger convinces Husserl to publish uh, these lectures in the exact state in which Eva Stein left them. Um, and he just slapped his name on it as editor. Uh, thankfully, the, um, when these were, when the critical edition of Husserliana was published, uh, the editors of the Husserliana uh, correct this mistake. Say Heidegger, this just, of the stem, the exact state. So, back to our mystery. Stein is working in the book's No, from the autobiography. Tim, you're, Tim, you're breaking up pretty bad. Sorry about that. Give me a second. Uh, also, yeah, try to wrap it up in like two minutes. All right, cool. Um, so Husserl doesn't engage. He refuses to, he doesn't bring this stuff to publication. He's too busy working on other things. Um, Stein gets increasingly frustrated and she resigns, right? Um, and she resigns with a draft of Ideas 2 and 3. Fast forward to 1952, Ideas 2 is published in the form in which Stein left it. Stein is credited as having edited the manuscript. Fast forward to 1998, there's a brilliant book called Body, Text, and Science, which a woman named Marian Subicki, uh, uh, the literacy of investigative practices, phenomenology of Eva Stein. Uh, what's important about this book for my particular presentation is that she visits the visual archives and she comes to understand more about the process uh, that Stein had to go through in preparing this manuscript. Um, basically, you see at the bottom here, this is Gobbleburger, this is shorthand. Uh, Husserl wrote all of his notes in shorthand, and uh, Stein had to basically work out uh, all of the shorthand into longhand, the complete sentences, expand sentences, compose introduction, write transition paragraphs, separate the notes into paragraphs and sec sections, write section titles, um, she had to select the sections, put them in order, number them, and draft the plan for the publishing. Right? She spent October to 1916 to February of 1917 working on the manuscript. She started with a nucleus of 84 uh, pages. Her work doubles the size of the manuscript. 
Also, we have to consider that in 1952, the editors of Idea 2 note that there is no connected manuscript with the rules for sections 43 to 47 of this work. Can you hear me, Jeff? Okay. I'm, I'm, I can see your face, and I'm like, I don't know. What so what's the, what's the conclusion? The conclusion that she comes to is that Stein actually authored large portions of Ideas 2, which had been attributed to Lucy. So, question, who wrote the book? Well, not so easy. Um, let's fast forward to the present, talk about the research. Um, the Husserl Archive in Belgium is producing a new edition of Ideas 2. It'll be out later this year um, in German. And it, consciously, they're producing it to try and remove Stein's fingerprints from the text um, because it is overwhelmingly, uh, her, her signature is all over. Uh, so I and a bunch of other Stein scholars are we're trying to disentangle Husserl and Stein's respective contribution. Uh, ideas too is one of the most important phenomenological texts of the 20th century, even if it's published uh, several years after Husserl's death. Uh, it, it, it becomes a source book. It's a source book for Merleau-Ponty and the phenomenology of perception. It changes the way that people think about phenomenology. Um, and it turns out that a lot of these ideas were actually designed working with Husserl's idea and trying to be sensitive to idea rather than uh, Husserl's actual own thought and just now coming to realize. Well, I think I stopped sharing my screen. You did. Yeah, Tim. Thank you so much for that. That was super interesting. Um, I don't know how well known that is. And I can't believe they're, they're taking measures to, to remove Stein's influence. That's really, that's scandalous. Dude, I have, a, uh, I have an advanced copy in PDF form uh, of the German version of the New Ideas 2. It's coming out later this year. Uh, there's a conference coming up in May which uh, I was supposed to go to Germany to participate in this conference with freaking pandemic.